All right, then. I'm going to get started now. Things looking good. Just going to, like... I'm paranoid, so I'm going to make sure that, like, actually... Things are working with these. So... Got a transition over. There we go. All right. So welcome everyone. Don't know that I doesn't look like I have any like I nope. Don't have any viewers yet, but it's just fine. Hello, Samrangi. I oh, should have put on my hat. And uh, this is going to be a little different stream than my usual streams. Well, also, it's kind of a rare thing that, A, I'm kind of like having the stream a second night in a row. I'm also going to be like reading this time, not playing a game or something like that. Um, because. I, I'm an anarchist, a libertarian socialist, and I also like to, like, educate myself on this topic, as well as, like, you know, bring this out and share this to, like, others, and so they can be able to, like, uh, learn with me as well. And so, the reason why I chose uh, this book, um, Direct Action, a, 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 no, ugh. oh, God, this is going to be good, because I'm going to be reading out loud, an echonography, by David Graeber is because a hey, well he tragically passed away just like last uh two Saturdays ago over a week ago so it's very unfortunate mm. you can then bring it along with me actually because there's the link uh to the anarchist library that has this book uh that's where I also got it I'm reading the um ebook of it the publisher of it because kind of actually like the app that I'm using to like uh, read it and so but part of the reason why I wanted to read direct action is that I think I think direct action should be included in that list of words that Americans should not use unless they know what it means you know like People talk about socialism, communism, capitalism, liberal, conservative, fascist, um, radical. And people that use those words, especially libertarian and they're Americans, they really have to prove that. I hope that stream's going well. I'm seeing, I'm seeing it refresh on, on my tablet. Uh, no one's watching, so <laughs> I have one viewer. Thank you for coming. I had this problem last night. It's a good thing that I just started too. So I'm refreshing it on my tablet. Bear with me. It's green, so I shouldn't have any like drop thing network error, error here. Okay, so hopefully it's like. It's all fine. Stop being paranoid. All right. I mean, I'm recording it anyway. I'll check the recording and make sure it's all good. Back to what I was saying. Um, uh, it's the list of words that like Americans cannot should not use until they actually know what capitalism means, know what socialism means, know what um, communism means. I think I'm going to include direct action in that list because a couple of times I've seen liberals, some of which are my friends and some of which I well respect, but they think direct, one of my friends think direct action is writing and emailing to your representatives. And I was just like, wait, what? Okay, action, yes. It's part of the political process. It's something that we should all do. It's something that's more than voting. I'm not dissing on writing uh, to your representatives and all. But is it direct action? 
I, my brain, when when my brain as a libertarian socialist thinks of direct action, I'm thinking of like wildcat strikes or like sit-ins or, um, you, you know, things that are outside of the normal way of doing business and politics in um, uh, electoralism. Basically something more than just voting, more than all these sort of things. And so I was, it, I was just taking it back. Because especially since direct, I see direct action as like doing praxis. If the like a place doesn't have drinking clean drinking water, instead of like writing to your representatives asking the government to provide this place with like clean drinking water, you actually go out there and dig your well yourself. That's praxis. That's direct action. I think not writing to your representatives. Um. So I was then taken aback by that, and this was from a friend, someone I kind of respect, but they're a liberal and don't understand errors against them, or they're how a better world can be better post the revolution, which hopefully is not fine with one. No uncoded messages over uh, open channels, and to us. No problem, thank you. Thank you for coming, the great. Anyway, um, so, uh, but the, also last Friday, uh, I, uh, people were talking about voting, and please do vote, and I'm not going to, like, shame anyone for, like, whoever you decide to vote on, um, is, except if you vote Trump, no, screw Trump, uh, and if you vote for Trump, you're a bad person, um, uh, but someone, I said, no, I, I would never vote for Trump. Um, but someone said uh, that voting is direct action. And I was just like, what? Someone actually believes that voting is direct action? So that's why I want to read this book. <clears throat> and, and, no, yes, Trump is a fascist. So that's why I'm never voting for Trump. I'm honestly not sure who I'm going to vote for um, come November anyway, but that's because I live in Washington State. It's a very blue state. Uh, it, we went to Hillary in 2016, but yet, because of Electoral College, four of our electors uh, did not vote for Hillary when they were supposed to. It's their own thing. Uh, welcome, uh, man, Questquiff88. Uh, also, this is a bit of a charity stream. I'm trying to like uh, raise money to my friend Joanna. You can find out the information there. Or, at the very least, if you can and donate money, don't worry. It's understandable with the world as it is right now. But there's the, her baking bowl in that Tumblr post. You can go, you share that around to try to get as many eyeballs on there as much as possible. Just any money that I receive through, like, Steam Labs or the other there are links down below, I'm just going to give directly to Joanna. I already give her a lot anyway. Um... And it's all going to continue to give money to her. But if people give me money, it'll go to Joanna. And so, but now, 10 minutes in, let's start reading Direct Action, A Iconography by David Graeber. Plus, table of contents. This is, a, uh, this is like a 400-page book, too, but the... And we finally, only until chapter five do we get to direct what is direct action and what is anarchism and, and violence versus nonviolence. Okay, so I'm going on. And it's, it's, it's interesting how this is going to start with like a diary, essentially, of and then trip and so on. So this is going to be quite interesting. And a lot more there. All right. So let's get reading. Preface. Direct Action, a Iconography A book this size un is unusual nowadays. It was certainly not my initial plan. When I first decided to begin writing some of my experiences of direct action from a, for from, a economic uh, from a economic perspective, I actually had intended to write a fairly short book. But the more I write, the more the topics seem to grow. I realized I was faced with a common dilemma of, iconography write of economic writing. Points that seem to simply, that seem simple and obvious to anyone who has spent years inside a given cultural universe requires a great deal of ink to convey to someone who hasn't. 
Something similar has happened to me when I returned to Chicago from my dissertation research in Madagascar many years ago. I'm going to quickly step in and say that, like, um, David Graeber released uh, a book. Uh, I forgot what it's called. I wish I could kind of, like, have it already right now. But you can look through David Graeber's, like, um, catalog of bibliography and and find that he did a, a book about his experience in Madagascar. He, he talks about it, that his experience in Madagascar quite a bit in like his other writings and his other lectures. And so he's probably going to he's kind of going probably going to come up quite a bit in this book. Um, I remember fretting over just how much I had to say. I felt I had at best two or three regular interesting points to make about the community I've been studying. Then the moment I started writing, I realized that to expl I realized that to any one of these points, to someone who is was not themselves from a rural Malagasyan community, would require several hundred pages. Mm. Which is why he wrote that book. <laughs> I apologize if I mispronounce words. Uh, I do have a slight case of dyslex dyslexia, so bear with me. But that's why I provide the link for people really long. <clears throat> by the time I have, by the time I was done writing, I also realized that most readers would probably find the exp exposition much, much, much more interesting. All in all, than whatever I originally thought was m the point. Uh, I call this book then a uh, tribute to the contribute relevance of economic writing. By economic writing, I mean the kind that aims to describe the contours of a social and con conceptual universe in a way that is at once theoretical and theoretically informed, but not in a self simply designed to advocate a simple argument of theory. There was a time when the detailed description of a political or ceremonial or exchange system in Africa or Amazonia was considered a valuable contribution to human knowledge itself. This is no longer really the case. A anthropological a anthropologist actually from Africa or Amazonia or even some parts of Europe might still be able to get away with writing such a book. Presently, the academic uh, convention in America, which a young scholar would be unwise to ignore, is that one must pretend one's description is really meant to make some larger point. This seems unfortunate to me. For one thing, I think it limits a book's potential to endure over time. Classic iconographies, after all, can be reinterpreted. New ones have always New ones, however fascinating, really present enough material to allow this. And what is there is tends to be strictly organized around a specific argument or related series of them. Therefore, let me warn the reader immediately. There is no particular argument to this book unless it's that the movement described within is well worth thinking about. This does not mean it does not contain theoretical arguments. Oh, hello, the quack. I'm I'm reading uh, David Graeber's uh, book, uh, Direct Action, which the link is. Uh, oh, okay. If you type like exclamation port reading, you will get the link to it. I got this book from the Anarchist uh, Library. Uh, it, it what you missed at the beginning is just like I'm reading this book because. Uh, liberals, some of which are my friends and I respect them, think that writing and emailing to your representatives is direct action. And last Friday, someone said that voting is direct action. And I was like, so that's why I'm reading this book. I also wanted to read it just in general. And and I think David Graeber's writing, May He Rest in Power, is uh, quite interesting. So anyway, thank you for coming, d <clears throat> <clears throat> Over the course of it, I make any number of them, whether about the ideological role of larger heavy objects, the political implications of the word opinion, the similarities of writing news stories and homer homeric, homeric 
epic uh, compositions or the cosmo cosmological role of the police in American cultures. Mm -hmm. hmm. Contemporary with the, like the events nowadays. What makes this a economic work in the classic sense of the term is that, as Franz Bo once put it, Bo's, Franz Bo's, uh, once put it, uh, the general is in the service of the particular aside. Perhaps from the final reflections. Theory is invoked largely to add in the ultimate task of description. Anarchist and direct action campaigns do not exist to allow some academics to make a theoretical point or prove some rival's uh, theory wrong, any more than do Bellinese's trance rituals or Ardine's irrational technologies. Iteration, uh, irrigation technologies. Uh, this is what happens when you like you see a word that your your brain thinks like, what does that word mean? Anyway, and it strikes me as a obnoxious, and it strikes me as obnoxious to suggest otherwise. I would like to think that as a result, the interest of this book might also endure not only for those who are motivated by historical curiosity, who wish to understand what it was actually like to have been in the middle of these events, but to ask in some sort of questions the actors in it were raising about the nature of democracy, autonomy, and possibilities, or for that matter, dilemmas, limitations of strategies of transformative political action. Some words of historical context. Enough time has passed since his breathless days of 2000 and 2001 that one can begin, perhaps, to see that historical moments, like in a uh, historical moments in a little bit of perspective, that period is, that period, it is now clear, marked a certain watershed global no neoliberalism. For a moment, I knew how that word was pronounced, but I still, my brain's just like, it's new, it's like, no, mm. Got it. Got to maintain hydration. I'm going to be speaking a lot. <clears throat> These were the years in which the Washington consensus of the 1990s was shattered. It happened very quickly. In fact, it is a testimony to the effectiveness of direct action that it took only about three years of large-scale popular mobilization in order to do so. It is sometimes hard to remember, nowadays, just what the days of the Washington Consensus were like. Perhaps it might be best to start, then, with a word of context, to help understand why it was the Zapatista Rebellion in 1994 served as a catalyst for the global movement against neoliberalism that followed, and why that movement came to take the form it did. I want to learn a lot about the Zapatistas' uh, rebellion, and they come up a bit in like David Graeber's uh, writings, because I have read uh, David a shorter book, about like 100 pages, of uh, fragments of the anarchist anthropology, trying to like, kind of like, give what what the anthropologists write about like anarchists and as well, or anarchist groups as well. I, I, I quite enjoyed that book, or kind of like how anthropologists would write about anarchism directly as well. Since uh, David Gray Rudy is an anarchist, and a well, he was an anarchist, rest in power, and was a the uh, London Schools and Economics professor of anthropology. Gotta remember the brief too. The momentary suspension of history. The years just before the Zapatista rebellion in Chavez announced itself to the world were possible the most depressing time the, to be a revolutionary, or even dedicated to the ideas of the left in living memory. It wasn't the collapse of the Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe that was depressing. Most radicals were glad to see them go. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Stalin. Uh, what was depressing was what happened afterwards. With Stalinism dead, 
most Marxists expected to see a, resonant, a renaissance of more humane forms of Marxism. Oh, I would like that too. Social Democrats believed that they had, a final, had finally won the argument with the revolutionary left and expected to shepherd the former subjects of the Soviet bloc into their fold. A reasonable expectation since when polled, most of the population of Central and Eastern Europe said they wanted to, eh, they wanted to model their new economics on Sweden. Understandable, honestly, with what other options you got, what other options are often presented in front of you, because, yeah, with neoliberalism, you're going to have to, with neoliberalism, you're going to have market-based, like, uh, capitalism. And, and yeah, so out of all the market-based capitalists and economic systems you can have, Sweden is probably one of the better models, which is a social democratic model, in a way. Instead, they got shock therapy and the most savage form of unrestricted unrestricted capitalism. Yep, neoliber neoliberalism. In almost every way, the world seemed to be heading for a nightmare scenario. <sighs> I think that nightmare scenario came to roost in 2020. Yes, 2020 should be cancelled. The romantic image of a guerrilla insurgency, which captured so many imaginations in the 1960s, was cascading into a kind of obscene self-parody. Yeah. Already in the 1980s, the right, which has been arguing for years that guerrilla insurgencies in places like Vietnam or Zambodia or El Salvador were not spontaneous but fiendish schemes created by foreign ideologies began to put their own theories into, pra in into practice with the US and South Africa intelligence agencies creating guerrilla armies like the Contras or Ramon to seek the to seek sick on the leftist regimes at the same time existing marxist guerrilla movements from cambodia to agronia had that had begun full of high-minded rhetoric were increasingly prone to become pure uh, um pure bandit kings or nihilist armies without any cause beyond their own rebellion yeah, they. Uh, this reminds me of like part one of like Bad Empanada's like video of like Shining Path, in Peru. Yeah, I'm sure that the people part of Shining Path have some good ideas in trying to like bring that form of socialism, state socialism, into Peru. But they did some horrible things, as China, as Mao and Lenin and Stalin did some horrible things too. So it's like. That's why I'm not that big a fan of those um, booms of those regimes. I like some of their ideas. I, I'm willing to learn, but still. Um, uh, David Gradiger continues, Those which held to the old ideal of social transformation, like the starting path in Peru, uh, seems, if anything, even worse. <laughs> well, like I just said. And Ben and Panada has a good video on the Shining Path, the atrocities that they uh, committed. Uh, but Ben and Panada is also going to make a follow-up video to that, uh, examining what the government approved has done. Um, that's was equally bad and terrible. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, Repti Libertarian movements everywhere else were transforming into vicious active wars. Then came the wave of genocide, of which Rwanda and the former Yavuksovic. Uh, I want to say Yugo Yugo Slavia. Yugo Slavia were only the more dramatic and visible. On the other, on a, on a Are we going to do that a lot? On a dozen interlocking registers, similarly, some on the on a dozen interlocking registers simultaneously, the emerging pattern seemed catastrophic. It seemed like it would go something like this: on an international level, capitalism was transforming itself into a revolutionary force. 
abandoning the welfare state version of capitalism that had actually won the Cold War. The old Cold Warriors and their corporate sponsors were demanding a more pure, no-holds-barred, free market version that had never actually existed. Maybe it existed in, like, the, um... Industrial Revolution, very few restrictions whatsoever, or like before the New Deal in America. But maybe I'm bringing up stuff that like David Graeber is going to like uh, bring up like in the next sentence, like with the Shiny Path example. And we're willing to wreak havoc on all existing institutions of social arrangements in order to achieve it all. All this involves a kind of weird inversion. The standard right-wing line, since at least in the 1790s, has always been that revolutionary dreams were dangerously precise, were, dang, were dangerous precisely because they were a utopian. They ha they ignored the real complexity of social life, tradition, authority, and human nature, and dream of rehashing the world according to some abstract ideal. By the 1990s. The places have been completely reversed. The left had largely abandoned utopianism, and the more it did so, the more it shriveled and, it shriveled and collapsed. Um, and even as they did so, the right then pick it up. Free market reformers overnight became, began declaring themselves revolutionary. The problem was they did so as the worst source of Stalinist. Essentially, telling the world's poor that science had proved there was only one way to go forward in history, that that this was understood by a scientific trained elite, and that therefore they had to shut up and do so as they were told, because even though the prescriptions might cause erroneous suffering and death and dislocation in the present. At some point in the future, they were not quite sure when. It would all lead to a a, par a paradise of peace and prosperity. The fact that the science itself had shifted from historical materialism to free market economics was a fairly minor detail. Anyway, it makes it easier to explain how former Stalinists from Romania to Vietnam found it so easy to simply switch hats and declare themselves neoliberals. Meanwhile, as structural adjustment policy stripped away what small social protections had existed from for the poorest inhabitants of the planet, propaganda and statistical manipulation had become so affected that the most mainstream Americans who pay attention to such matters were convinced that the conditions for the world's poorest were actually improving, and not just in areas like the East Asia that had mostly refused to adopt neoliberal policies. That's actually something that like um, was brought up in Renegade Cuts' a video of like what radicalized is them him but it's been brought up in many times over and over again of the imf and the world bank where where they set the standard for like poverty it's really just like i heard it before it's just two dollars a day but in running good cuts video it's like a dollar 90, 90 cents a day so if you make one dollar and 91 cents or two dollars and one cent per day you're not impoverished by not having any social safety net, not having any housing, or not having any health care. Neoliberals and capitalism. Every progressive victory seems to have been threatened or re or reversed. In South in South Africa, generations of struggle had finally eliminated racial apartheid. A moment of happiness, uh, happiness, certainly. But an almost identical system was being created on the global scale. Based on increasingly militarized borders and on labor migration regimes where, for those trapped in poor countries, residents in rich, largely white countries was dependent on possessions of identity of identity papers and willingness to work in jobs the residents themselves weren't willing to do. Feminism was being retrenched. Uh, former victories over sweatshop labor, child labor, and even ch chattel la slavery were all being 
eroded to or downright eradicated. Much of the problem stemmed precisely from the route the rot of the dream of social revolution. For those utopian fantasies that had always been necessary to inspire people to the passion of self-sacrifice required to actually work to transform the world in the direction of greater freedom and greater equality. I am referring here to genuine living utopianism, the idea that radical alternatives are possible and that one can begin to create them in the present as opposed to what might be called scientific utopianism. The idea that the revolutionary is the agent of the inevitable march of history, which was so easily and catastrophically appropriated by the right. The murder of the dream can only lead to the nightmare. It made it almost impossible to form a center for which the to fight the incursions of the now supercharged revolutionary right. Social Demo democratic parties in Europe, for example, which were born from a reformist, reformist strain of Marxism, first seemed re ra really rather pleased with the collapse of their revolutionary cousins. They have finally won the argument until they realized that their own appeal was the willingness of capitalists to engage with them it was almost entirely based on their ability to position themselves as the least threatening alternative before long the social democrats regimes had experienced such a moral and political collapse that the few still in power were reduced to becoming the agents for the dismantling of the welfare states they had originally created the activists in the left and the industrialized countries were becoming increasingly reactionary and capable of mobilizing passions only to defend things that already existed the ozone layer affirmative action programs trees and increasingly ineffectively elsewhere it seemed in near total collapse i just want to quickly go back to uh this part right here yeah that's why we got the new deal uh fdr franklin that rose down it often credit himself that his biggest accomplishments is that he saved capitalism and he saved capitalism by creating the new deal because and how that got how fdr was kind of like forced to create those kind of like massive sweeping reforms in america that did save capitalism is that the socialists and the communists and the activists that were at the time in 1930 they kind of saw the 1917 russia revolution and think we could do that and kind of threatened if they are that like hey if we don't get like some of these like demands that we have see what's going to happen in russia that's going to happen here so fdr or fdr tried to like stop the socialists and communists from doing that and said hey listen let me work with the capitalists like big wigs to get a, a new deal and it was, it would make everyone's like lives materially better or and so that we don't have a revolution and it's kind of like if you get most of them the socialists and communists if you get most of those those big businesses on then i'll be something and he and fdr did he only convinced half of them half of them went with the new deal to be taxed heavily but those taxes funded a lot of social programs some of which we still have some which have been run away Hey, well, the other half of those those businesses wanted to do the uh, business plot. <laughs> yes, there was an attempt to coup on uh, FDR to be overthrown. Those CEOs really did not know what they were doing. They asked a friend of FDR's, a um, military guy, a general, to try to do that. But anyway, getting off topic, back to the book. But the history of the New Deal from FDR is fascinating to me. I heard a lot about it. And the business plot is quite interesting. Probably should read that book. Anyway. Then finally, there was globalization. As Anna Singh, uh, Anna Singh uh, 2002, has recently reminded us, there's a curious history here. The notion really begins as a progressive one. It was a stronger version of internationalism. The sense not only that all men and 
our brothers, but that we are the common custodians of a single fragile planet. An idea encapsulated by photographs of the Earth taken from outer space by astronauts in the 1960s. The 1990s rhetoric of globalization had none of this. Essentially, it had two legs. One was that telecommunications, and particularly the internet, were annihilating distance and making instant contact possible between any point of the planet. The other was the fall of the Iron Curtain, and other barriers to trade in and other barriers to trade were, at the same time, created a single unified global market whose finance mechanisms could then operate through these same instant electronic means. Yep, yeah, that's something. Mainly, it was just the power of finance capital. But the rhetoric was unusual, uh, usually a comp- uh, uh, But the rhetoric was usually accompanied accompanied finally remember how to like pronounce that word brain work by a series of very broad generalizations that not only money but products ideas and people were flowing about us never before national economies could no longer dream of being autonomous old nationalistic ideologies indeed national borders were becoming increasingly irrelevant and so on all of this was presented as happening all of, of its own accord. Technologies advanced, people were increasing in contact with one another, and the only possible language for them to deal with one another was trade, since capitalism was, after all, rooted in human nature. I could go on a whole rant about how I hate the human nature argument from capitalists. Another time. I got more water here. But yeah, if you want to just like 30 minute tirade from he just like say Socialism won't work because of human nature. Anyway. For anyone who was really paying attention, of course, the reality was very different. Borders were not being effaced, but reinforced. Poor populations were still penned into their countries of origins, in which existing social benefits were being rapidly withdrawn. Globalization merely refer to the ability of finance capital to skip around as it wish and take advantage of the of that fact. Yep. Uh capital can freely move around the world, uh, but people cannot. The current crisis at the concentration camps, the genocide is happening in America is kind of evidence of that. As well as like the rising fascism as in this America as it is. Mm. Most of all, however, the period of globalization or neoliberalism, as it came to be known just about everywhere except America, <sighs> probably put globalization and uh, neoliberalism in those words that Americans should not be allowed to use until they can prove they actually know what they mean, like socialism, and capitalism, and direct action. Uh, saw the creation of the first general planetarian bureaucratic system in human history. In retrospect, I, I very much imagine that this was how the last years of the 20th century would be seen. The, U, the, U, the UN had only can, cor, only of course the UN had of course existed since mid-century, but the UN had never had more than the moral authority. What was being patched together now was a system with teeth. At the top, we were the financiers, bankers, currency traders, hedge fund operators, and the like, all connected electronically. They were the gigantic bureaucratic organized transnational that transnationals that during this period were absorbing and consolidating literally millions and forming independent enterprises. They were the global trade bureaucrats, 
uh, International Monetary Fund, IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization, WTO, and so on, but also including institutions like the U.S. Federal Reserve, treaty organizations like the European Union, or the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA whose chief role seems to be to protect the interests of the first two. Yeah. Excuse me. Ah, that reminds me of another book I want to eventually read. It's David Harvey's Brief History of Neoliberalism. I think that if you were fascinated by that uh, kind of like a paragraph that I just read, or that section of it, or like these sections of this book, the introduction... Uh, do read, uh, check out uh, Davy Harpy's uh, Brief History of Neoliberalism. Anyway, and finally, there were the various tiers of NGOs whose roles, from providing farm credits to inoculating. In, in, in I don't know how to pronounce that word. Inculcating. Inoculcating calculating infants or providing food during famines and in inoculating my brain finally found it I, I don't remember seeing the word uh, there I remember hearing the word and, that, and that's part of my in my own case it's dyslexia I have to actually see if I hear the word okay I can hear the word and remember the audio track of it but if I don't actually see it I cannot visualize the word from the audio part of it in my brain I have to visually see that see someone else read that as in in, in calculating in okay you know in okay you know, I can't speak. Uh, and I'm reading the book. <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, inoculating. Just remember now. Um, I, I, it's, until someone else reads that word and I see the word itself, then I can pair the audio part and the visual part. But if I just see the visual part, I don't have the audio part. If I just hear the audio part, I don't have the visual part. It's like it's slightly difficult for my brain to like match those two. Uh, inoculating infants or providing food during famines increasingly came to be pro to provide services that the that states had once been expected to supply, but had effectively now been forbidden from doing by the IMF. The remarkable thing was that this was achieved through a ideology of radical individualism, American head American hegemony. Above all, a broad rejection of the claims of common community and political community in particular. We were all to be rational individuals on the market. Yeah, try to like go talk to any like economist, and they'll they'll actually believe that each person is a rational individual on the market, and try to like buy low, sell high, always with everything. Aiming to acquire goods. Insofar as we were different, it was to be a matter of personal self realization through consumption, since consumption, in turn, was assumed to be largely about the creation and expression of in identities. Then, of course, identity could be said to circle back, since all political and economical questions were assumed to be effectively settled. History, in this respect, was over. Franz Fukunama said the end of history. Identity politics became about the only politics can, that could be considered legitimate. Yep. Uh, uh, even like Ralph, uh, Ralph Nader got shunned for like talking about class. You can't talk about class. No. Howard Zinn mentioned that in the essay he wrote in the early 2000s. Before he died, I think. I think Howard Zinn died in like 2003. Alright, continue. Then history began again. All this makes it easy to see why the Zapatista Rebellion, which began in January 1st, 1994, the day in which the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, went into effect, marked as such a turning point. The Zapatistas were their rejection of were their the Zapatistas with their rejection of the old 
old-fashioned guerrilla strategy of seizing state control through armed struggle with their call of stead for the creation of autonomous democratic self-governing communities. In alliance with a global network, network of like-minded democratic revolutionaries managed to crystallize in often often in beautiful poetic language, all the strains of oppression that had been slowly consolidating, coalescing in years before. As members of the Midnight Notes Collective aptly pointed out, even at the time, opposition to the IMF imposed structural adjustment policies Whether it took from the form of Latin American indigenous rights campaigns, um, African food riots, or Indonesian Islamic movements, almost in invariably was based on the moral defense of some collective resource, the right to treat land or food or fossil fuels or even culture, not as marketable commodity, but as a common good collectively administrated by some form of moral community. Even if in fewer and fewer cases was the nation-state seen as the proper guardian of such rights or the framework of a moral community in question, almost always their sights were set both more locally and on a planetary scale. The Zapatistas, with their depth ability to employ emerging global communications technologies to, the mobilization, to mobilize international networks, to defend their own autonomous enclaves in the Lacanian rainforest were not only the perfect symbol, they managed to articulate what was happening through a new approach of the very idea of revolution. Yeah, uh, because most of the other like s socialist revolutions in the past were of... Um... That's okay, Lynn. Hell, welcome. I'm just going through the pre... I'm still in the priest phase of um, direct action and iconography. I'm set, as I'm stumbling over uh, words and stuff like that. Uh, the reason why I chose this book is, A, because I like David Graeber's writing. I've read some of his books. Um, it, you also I know that you also enjoy David Graeber's work. He passed away. But it was also mainly because, like, Friday, someone said that direct that voting is direct action. Which I was like... Mm-hmm. Yep, there's the Steam links. Yep. Um, and there's the link to the uh, book at the Anarchist Library. The Anarchist Library has, like, posted uh, quite a bit uh, more of uh, David Graeber's work, so it's all cool. It, I've only read seven pages, too, as well. <laughs> <clears throat> but, yeah, since the liberals seem to think that like, writing or emailing your representatives is direct action... Yeah, this is the first half of the preface. Uh, and since some liberals think voting is direct action, I was like, that can't be right. So anyway, I'll continue. In turn, it was the Zapatistas who began with their two international... I'm not coming against some word on... Incronus? I don't know how to pronounce... I don't know how to pronounce that word. Anyway, for humanity and against uh, neoliberalism to lay the foundation for what came to be known as the anti-globalization movement. Now, this term, as I have heard many times before, is something of a mis misnomer. It was basically an invention of the media. The most, um, the most dynamic and important elements in the movement always... I always saw it aiming for a genuine democratic form of globalization at the very least, a return to the sort of planetarian consensus for which the term first emerged. In any case of anarchists, autonomous, and other such radical elements, it's meant to the effacement of all international borders entirely. Yeah, I agree. No nations, no borders. Borders are violence. What emerged from the Zapatistas... Yeah, what has borders given us? I mean, in Cronus, 
was a loosely organized planetary network called People's Global Action, one of whom's aims was to put nonviolent direct action back on the world stage as a force for global revolution. PAG was significant above all in that it explicitly rejects the participation of political parties or any group whose purpose was to become a government. That's the kind of group I want to be part of. It was PAG, in turn, that put out the first calls to action that eventually com cumulated into November 1999 actions in Seattle. I actually remember that. I was in school when that happened. Uh, I And from the Seattle area. So, yeah, that was on the news nightly, uh, that sort of things. But that was one thing I didn't, like, remember hearing, like, from my older brother, actually, who was following that is that most of the people there were some people that were coming like out from outside of seattle that were they were protesting the wto and that was kind of like the assessment i got that like there was going to be riots no matter which city it was happening in it just happened to happen in seattle and seattle actually has some like radical like a history to it too like the 1915 like a uh, general strike um so anyway continuing Rather than trying to narrate the story myself, it would be told many times in different ways over the course of the book. Let me instead provide the reader with a timeline of only the most important events. What follows is a bare bones account, and it reflects a very North American perspective, but readers may find it useful to consult now and again while reading this work. Yeah, I yeah, I agree, Lynn. I, in the current events that happened, it just proves that. I mean, in the first, in the after the first full week of June, the Seattle Police Department received 12,000 complaints because that was like the week of the George Floyd's um, lynching that the, there was protests happen. And a car uh, was set on fire. A police car was set on fire in Westlake, uh, in Seattle, that Saturday. Yeah. And then, of course, like, uh, the Chas and Chop, uh, the Capitol Hill Thomas Zone was, like, formed a week or two later. A week later, actually. Yeah. So, anyway. Uh, January 1st, uh, 1994, a uh, North American Free Trade Agreement goes into effect, uprising by the Island the uh, I'm not gonna pronounce in the first word Zapatista the electoral nationalists or the uh, Zapatistas and Chavez begin with a surprisingly military offense that leads briefly to the seizure of the Zapatistas uh, the Chavez capital San Cristobal de la Casa. Apologize for my mispronunciation of all these words. The Zapatistas, however, quickly transformed from an offensive force to a defensive one, creating a series of self-governing autonomous communities seeking international allies and uh, no, I know, promulgating a policy of direct actions, democratic experimentation, and a new approach to, a, to revolution that converges with the anarchist tradition in its refusal of traditional attempts of transformation through the seizures of state power. August 1997. Second, Sapatista International Encouragement for Humanity Against Neoliberalism in Spain ends with a call to create an international network that ultimately can be known in English as People's Global Action. Aside from the Zapatistas themselves, the core of the PGA, I, I used to play golf, so part of me wants to say Pro Golf Association. <laughs> Um, but anyway, at first consists of the Brazilian Landless Farmers Movement, eh, MST, the the Indian Carnitica State Farmers Association, KRS, a mass-based like Ghanaian uh, direct action movement, anarchist or anarchist inspired groups like La. Ya Basta in Italy and reclaimed the streets in the UK. Mm, the streets. And various indigenous and, and Angurian movements and radical labor unions. Don't forget the unionized people. Apologies. I burped. 
June 18th, 1999, J18, uh, the first massive PGA-sponsored Global Day of Action known alternately as the Global Day of Action Against Financial Centers or Calvar against, uh, Carnival Against Capitalism. Uh, to coincide with the G8 meeting of the leaders of the major industrial powers with coordinated actions in over 100 cities worldwide from Australia to Zimbabwe. That's how you pronounce it, right? In America, several dem demos are organ organized, mostly on the banner of the new American version of Reclaim the Streets. I wonder if they're so real. November 30th, 1999, NG N30, actions against the WTO municipal meetings in Seattle, another international day of action proposed by PGA. The action is long in the planning, but comes as a total surprise to the mainstream media who saw it as the birth of, the, of a movement. Seattle saw sharp divisions over tactics between nonviolent protesters conducting the lockdowns and barricades of a hotel where the misnis municipal is taking place, organized by the newly con created Direct Action Network, Dan, and participants in a smaller black block, I approve your black block, mostly made up of anarchists and radical ecologists who had a more militant interpretation of nonviolence. Militant nonviolence. I like that. Uh, who are uh, in a video game, should not advocate and condone TOS, but in a video game, and no uncoded uh, messages over open channels. After police began to attack the, block, the blockaders, started a campaign of targeted property damage against symbols of corporate power, mostly windows downtown. On the first day, the meeting, on the first day, the meeting, the meetings are actually shut down and negotiations end in failure. The next few days saw massive repression culminating in the declaration of martial law and summoning of the National Guard. Yeah, I remember those days. The months later following Seattle are filled with bursts of new organizing and activity and the creation of autonomous chapters of Dan in cities across the U.S. and even Canada. I want to briefly come in because, again, I I remember watching this a lot on the news. Yeah, we should lend, should have pride, and should pride have rainbow block? I approve. I'm for that. After all, I mean, the first pride was a riot at Stonewall. Um, but something that kind of like occurred to me as I started learning about like radical leftist politics in the last three years um when i think back to like how the events of like the seattle protests of the wto riots um was kind of like put there that's where i remember thinking like oh there are anarchists there and they're causing property destruction of like mostly just like again they 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 broke a Starbucks window. Yeah, but it's like it's symbolic. And the people inside of those, like Starbucks, that are part of them, were fine. I mean, flustered, a bit scared, but they were fine. They lived. It's just property damage. Come on. But uh, that, but I kind of remember maybe thinking like anarchists about like that. But that impression was there, but didn't hold strong. I agree. I care more about the tents in the end house than like the Starbucks windows. I'm with you there, Lynn. There's, there's a lot of homeless people in Seattle too, and I see those tents in quite a few places. Probably should like consider like a joining like uh, organizations trying to help that out. Well, I'm actually um, part of the Seattle DSA, and they do have a group just like uh, helping with that. So I probably should plug myself into like that sort of group. Um. But my impression of anarchists was kind of like seeded there um, from the reports of the WTO riots and how it was broadcast. Thankfully, it didn't stick for me as I learned about like um, sort of with feminism and then radical leftist politics and socialism and uh, communism. So when I heard of anarchists about three years ago, I was actually open to them. But mentioning if someone, if that impression of anarchists from the WTO rights as someone who's smashing Starbucks windows, and 
But notice how the Starbucks window people don't care about the personal belongings of the unhoused. Yeah, I agree. That actually happened when uh, Chaz and Chapu got shut down by the Seattle, um, the Seattle mayor, or who this residents of Seattle wants uh, her to have her resignation. Uh, wants her to resign and. How the Seattle Police Department just, they came in and just like took everything, either trash all of the belongings or the tons, all, all the things that were there, or just like took it in like, I don't know, civic forfeiture. That's where that does. And there's been like sweeps to try to clean up the tents in like, or in certain, or the homeless essentially in certain parts of Seattle and that has conducted sadly and yeah they're still doing that just like taking personal belongings of the unhoused and yet people care more about like Starbucks windows it's sometimes a little hard to get through on some people yeah it is legal looting done by cops that's what it is that's what effective what it is anyway Gonna continue on with the list of events. Uh, April 16, 2016, actions against the meetings of the World Bank and IMF in Washington, D.C., while not a tactical success at Seattle. The meetings are not shut down. Hey, hey say what you will about like the, the people who were rioting in the streets. No, they're protesting. They effectively shut down those meetings. Uh, A16 marks the beginning of a reapproachment between the Dan organizers and the uh, autonomous or revolutionary anti-capitalist bloc. The black bloc assembled from the occasion with the ACB re ref uh, refra refrain from property destruction and instead providing support for blockaders and those in lockdown. So maybe smashing windows is the kind of way to go. Again, just property damage. <clears throat> August 1st, uh, 2000, R2K. Uh, actions against the Republic Convention in Philadelphia combined with D D2K. Actions against the Democratic Conventions in Los Angeles. These are collectively known as activists as R2D2. Yes, there are nerds and geeks amongst them like anarchists and radical leftists. Absolutely. Uh, while Ladan did reject um, widespread uh, direct action for a strategy of marches in alliance with uh, community groups, the Philly actions organized above all by Dan's in New York, Philly, and D.C. Sorry. Uh, marked further... Uh, Integration of Black Bloc and blockaders with the revolutionary anti-authoritarian bloc. Hmm. In, in these cases, providing a diversion to draw police away from the lockdowns. Uh, Philly is also marked as by an attempt to create alliances between the mostly white Dan's and radical people's color organizations and mi with mixed success. Uh, so... Uh, white radical leftists um, uh, practice inter intersectionality. They at least attempted to like work with uh, people of color organizations, and well, we'll have to do better with the mixed results, mixed with the mixed success. Uh, retrospectively, it seemed as the point where the lockdown blockade strategy has largely run its course, uh, prompting an interesting, in prompting. A interest in creating more mobile tactics. Okay. Uh, September 26, 2000. S26. Actions against the IMF World Bank meetings in Prague, Czech Republic. Prague, Czech Republic. This is the first large and dramatic action in Europe after Seattle. Like many European actions, the level of militarism is much greater in the U.S. The actions see fierce clash between black bloc anarchists and police. The first appearance of the festive pink bloc mm, we're getting closer to the rainbow bloc um, was the first international debut of the Italian white overalls tactics. Ooh, the, the Italian word trebuges uh, organized by Italian la badista. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. I'm more confident with that one. 
A kind of comic mock army of activists in helmets, paddings, shields, and often inflatable inner tubes whose attempt to storm police lines and armed police lines armed, among other things, with balloons and water pistols. Hey, they're not really attacking the um cops. Uh, it gets it gets you notice. Pink block was not what I expected to be, but oh well. It'll be transferred to rainbow block later. <clears throat> January 20th, 2001, J20. Protest at Bush inauguration. The second largest inaugural, inaugural protest in America history. Oh, I wonder. Uh, I, th I, think, I think the one for the 2017 one, the Trump's, uh, probably was the largest. But this was definitely the largest at that time, especially since, like, um, Jeb Bush, uh, dropped a lot of, like, people of colors, like, um, um, votes in, like, Florida, which kind of, like, helped guide it close for between, is it Bush, is it Gore, is it Bush, and Gore, and then the, um, someone who worked on Bush's, like, campaign in Florida had an office in Florida, secretary of, uh, I forgot. It was in Radical Cuts uh, video of what radicalized him. Um, Lieutenant Governor, I think. Anyway, she stopped the re recount short and then went to the Supreme Court because the Florida State Supreme Court uh, didn't have enough Republicans on there or conservatives on there, so it went to the Supreme Court. So, yeah. So, they're not surprised that the the inauguration of Bush's um, president's NC in 2001 had the it was the second largest anarcho protest in American history. Oh, I wonder if like uh, Trump's one was the largest, or what was the largest before Trump's. Anyway, getting distracted. Um, though they receive almost no attention from the mainstream media, that's probably why we don't remember it. Hmm. Uh, most of the members of the NC, uh, NYC Dan end up joining uh, another uh, revolutionary anti-black and anti-authoritarian black blog app. Uh, the Black Bloc managed to clash through police barricades and temporarily occupy Naval uh, Memorial, hoisting a black flag and blocking the parade route and, and Bush's motorcade. Mm, got their attention for some time before they've finally been forced out by Secret Service and police. Uh, January 25th to 30th, uh, 2001, uh, the first World Social Forum, the WSA, the WSF. It is held in Proto Aglir Al Aligri, Aligri uh, Brazil. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. Apologies again. Originally conceived as a radical alternative to the World Economic Forum (WEF), a kind of junket and a networking session for um, global officials and bureaucrats who held, usually held in Davos, Switzerland, the WSF rapidly became the intellectual center of the global movement against neoliberalism, with thousands of different organizations and individuals participating in hundreds of sessions. April 20 to 22nd, 2001. Actions against the Summit of Americans. Uh, negotiations over the free trade area of the Americans PAC, uh, FTAA, in Quebec City, Canada. This is the first action where the authorities organized their strategy around building a large fence, the wall, uh, around the sections of the cities where the summit is to take place. Excuse me again. My apologies. The actions organized primarily by the Montreal-based Convergence de los Anticapitalistas, or CLAC, CLAP, CLAC, uh, mainly aimed attacks at the wall itself as a symbol of the contradictions of neoliberalism. July 19th to 21, 2001, several hundred thousand protesters converged on Genome, Italy for the G8 meetings of the heads of the industrial nations. The wall strategy is again employed by the Italian police, who had traditionally been relatively tolerant of white overall tactics. Adopt the strategy of extreme repression this time. Mmm. 
The cops didn't want the Italian police did not want to be humiliated this time. Um, refusing any contact with protest leaders and employing a systematic strategy of encouraging fascists and ancient provocateurs to provide excuses to attack, arrest, and afterwards systematically abuse and even tortured activists. Geneva is seen as a watermark of repression in Europe and causes European groups to scramble to formulate a new strategy. Some of those who join forces are the same who burn crosses. <sighs> of course, the police working working with the fascists. This is kind of this is very, so yeah, yeah, and they still do it. They're still doing it today. That's what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. How terrible though that was. So yeah, new strategies that be like form. September 11, thousand one. Yeah, attacks on Pentagon and World Trade Center. Anarchists in New York are among the first to mobilize against the upcoming war. Uh, with marches com culminating in a march of 6,000 people in Times Square a month after the event. These are almost completely ignored in the mainstream media. Yeah, that's probably I don't, why I don't remember it happening. Actions being planned for the upcoming... Uh, uh, which is why the revolution won't be televised. It won't be on YouTube. It won't be on Twitch. Good luck at it being on Facebook as well. Anyway, actions being planned for the upcoming World Bank IMF meetings in Washington D.C. are radically scaled back as the movement forces it to reconsider its overall strategic direction. February three to four, two thousand two, World Economic Forum protests in New York City. In the immediate wake of 9-11, the WEF announced it will relocate this year from Davos, where it has become the object of frequent activist sieges, hmm, to the Wall of Austerity uh, in New York as a act of solidarity. Anarchists in New York, uh, NYC Dan, and the newly created NYC at the Anti-Capitalist Convergence, ACC, are forced to throw together in action in a matter of months and banned by almost all of their usual NGO and labor allies. Mm. The action is successful and non-violence pulled off, Excuse me, but is met by massive police intimidation and hundreds of arrests. Even when we protest non-violently, the police will, at least it's just saying that there's a bunch of arrests, they didn't say about anything else. But it's like, even when we protest peacefully, no, they don't want that. Uh, the stress of 9-11 and of being forced to create a national mobilization out of nothing in such a short time. Yeah, police will provoke violence. That was, that we know that, we have learned that from like uh, this year as well. Um is uh, being forced to create no, uh, national mobilization out of nothing in such a short time created endless tensions within the New York scene and eventually led to decline of eventual delusion of Dan over the course of the next year. September 10th to 14th, 2003. WTO ministri ministerials in Cancun, Cancun, I knew I, I heard that part before, that the name of the city, Cancun, Mexico. Max action, mass actions by Mexican and global activists, including the, the dramatic suicide of a South Korean farmer, end in a decisive, in, a, in a definite check to the WTO process. In November 17 to 21, 2003. FTAA negotiations in Miami met by the first general large-scale national convergence in the U.S. since 9-11. Since These meetings were also seen the first use in the U.S. of a new policy of massive preemptive attacks and extreme police violence against protesters, an approach that comes to be known as a Miami, that's the Miami model after Homeland Security announced it as a way to deal with such actions in the future. The free trade negotiations, on the other hand, came to nothing and marking the definitive end of the FTAA process. 
So hey, direct action did some things, yeah. I'll end here. Not because Miami represents the end of anything, though some have agreed it marks the end of one cycle of 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 at least the North American movement. Okay. But rather because it marks the end of the period covered in this book. September 11th and the War on Terror did certainly create a dramatically new climate in the U.S. Yeah, it's like it was a terrible tragedy in 9 left, no question about that. But then we kind of, oh, as a country, unified to become a cult of almost like support the troops, support the troops, support the troops, support the troops. Wait, we're in Iraq now? So, yeah. Um, new climate, it, so it, it created a dramatically new climate in the United States, but its effects elsewhere was were less profound and certainly less enduring. In other parts of the world, repression was never so severe, and most managed to avoid the wave of xenophobia and materialist, and mi- militarist nationalism that did so much damage in the U.S., yeah, we became a cult. In many ways, the movement began to go into new and broader stage, particularly in Latin America, with the rise of factory occupations and local assemblies in Argentina. Oh yeah, I mean, David Gerber talked about like the um, uprising, uprising in like uh, Argentina in two thousand one, where any politician could not go outside to like a restaurant or something like that. You know how like in, in the past couple of years, like Mitch McConnell got harassed at like a restaurant, couldn't have a peaceful dinner or something like that because of what was happening at the concentration camp. Same with Sarah Huckabee Sanders and all those things. Okay, imagine that was happening to any politician: Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. Maybe even like someone like AOC, if Argentina in 2001 had someone as progressive as AOC or someone to the furthest left as possible as someone like AOC or Bernie Sanders. But no, every politician from either party getting harassed like that in Argentina. That's what was happening. The politicians in Argentina was like afraid to go outside. Anyway, uh, so um, hopefully, Dave Gruber has talked about that a lot in his like, lectures and other talks. So I wonder if he's going to be covered in this book. Looking forward to that. Or one time PG com- uh, convert conversions like Ero Ir- Ir- Evo Morales actually coming to power in Bolivia. Yeah. And then there was a coup that happened in Bolivia last year. And the interim governors I don't know if they're still holding elections for Bolivia. Um events in Antagio Asanium and other parts of Mexico. So, apologies for mispronouncing those itself. I do not want to generalize or make predictions at n- uh, moments of genuine change. History makes fools of us all who try. But it will at least uh, repeat what I said before. Uh, E.g. Graber 2002 and Dave Graber in Conference 2004. That anarchism as a political philosophy and anarchist ideas uh, and impairments have become more and more important everywhere in the world. This is a broad realization that the age of revolution is by no means over, but that revolution will, in the 21st century, take on increasingly unfamiliar forms. First and foremost, I would hope this book is, will serve as a resource for those who wish to think about expanding their sense of political possibilities. For anyone curious about what's the new direction's radical thought and actions might take. Yeah, I had this a bit of discussion with like someone close to me of how I mean, it kind of like, yeah, is because David Graver said it's like revolution is not over, but it will be unknown familiar forms. Because when you, especially if you're an anarchist and you're just leading through like the anarchist library, I see you link there, or at least to the David Graver's work to the anarchist library. But if you go through the other older um, anarchist writers like Mbit, Mikhail Bakunin, uh, Peter Kropotkin, Elker Manatessa, they, uh, probably even like Emma Goldman and now Sam Berkman, they've kind of thought that the revolution is going to happen every day now. It definitely seemed like that. And so they were writing about it and preparing for that. The whole point of the, con- part of the whole point of the Conquest for Red from Peter Kropotkin is that like, 
how to plan for that revolution. If there's going to be a revolution, you got to have bread. You got to feed the revolution. And so that was the thesis of that whole book. Still a good book. And, and that's why also Eric and Tesla wrote about anarchy and wrote about the anarchist program as well, because they really thought that the revolution was going to happen in a day now. So, but as David Graeber's going to like continue on here, it's going to be a revolution. It's not going to, but it's not going to be like we thought of it before. So we probably should like think about uh, new ways of like thinking about revolution. That's including myself, because I'm passionate about like there being a revolution as well. Hopefully non-violent, though. In a video game. Um, and I hope, I'm ready for... I'm eager for there to be a revolution in a video game. Because uh, I don't know how TOS feels about that. But it's probably not going to be like the revolutions that were written about 100 years ago. Or even... We're not going to have like a revolution like the Russian revolution in 1917. From what if, and from a Russian person I talked to, no, that you wouldn't want that, I guess. And unfortunately, a revolution is up there as like words that for Americans not to use until they actually acknowledge what they know how it means. Because when you talk to Americans, typical Americans, about revolution, it's usually they'll think of American Revolution or the French Revolution... And those are both terrible because they're both uh, utterly violent. That's all I am. Anyway, a few acknowledgments. It's very difficult to write acknowledgments for a book like this. One does not wish to single out anyone for fear of suggesting that someone else is less deserving. But I can start by acknowledging the love support of my friends and family and my supporters at Yale. It's probably when he was still teaching at Yale or writing at the times when he was teaching at Yale, uh, during the unfortunate events of that transpire, to some degree, as a result of the very research on this book is based. The period during which I was writing, con I was conducting research and then writing, writing, this book was one almost continuous stress and personal tragedy, marked up by the prolonged illness and eventual death of both my brother and my mother. Oh, oh. Ooh. Wow. Uh, all against the backdrop of having to deal with endless, bizarre campaigns by those elements of of the senior faculty uh, at Yale apparently determining to drive me out by any means necessary. Uh, Narco Black uh, put up uh, the interview um, that Charlie Rose did of David Graeber in 2006. Which that what him being forced out of Yale was the reason for um, Charlie Rose to have uh, David Graeber on to talk about anarchism and talk about that. Quite interesting uh, interview. Um, Sister Justice Alchemy number one thirteen towards the end of that stream. Uh, me and my uh, Letrano and uh, John Brockman. You can find a link there to that channel. This a podcast and live stream I co-host. Um, we watch and react to that video and it, actually our insights is quite interesting but the interview itself is quite interesting too it's because yeah david river talks about like that time he was like forced to leave yale i will not enter into details but i would like to thank first all my colleagues at yale who provide the support and sense of community that made this place livable for me and looks like a bunch of names um and to name a few friends and colleagues outside of Yale who grew up who gave me help and encouragement to this project are far too numerous to list. I would like to be able to be able to uh, to thank a by name who pitched in after the department voted to terminate my contract, but it would be impossible. Uh, almost 5,000 people signed a petition that Yale students created several departments, Chicago, uh, Suffolk, uh, Glasgow, Manchester, and organizations ranging, ranging from Global Studies Association to the Canadian Unions of Postal Workers, wrote collective letters to the department demanding a explanation. Of course, they received none. As did an endless stream of individual scholars. Most of all, I want to thank the students at Yale, and again, this list is by no means comprehensive and heavily weighted towards those I came to know in my last few years at Yale, but they were always my greatest inspiration there, and a list of students. 
And that's actually one of the th things that kind of like led uh, to um, Deborah Graber being like fired by Yale. The faculty the wanted to get rid of uh, David Graber because David Graber kind of was like saying, "No, no, don't, 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 don't kick the student out. This is a good student." I think a student was trying to like form a union for like grad students or something like that, and that student was doing activism. Faculty of Yale want to kick that student out or expel that student. Uh, it's where kick them out, but David Graeber naturally stepped. No, the students were were protecting that student, and they encouraged David Graeber to like step in too. And he was like, he wanted to keep his like his activism in New York separate from like his study at Yale. But then it, that happened at Yale, and so David Graeber felt compelled by the students as well uh, to no, 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 this student's a good student. They allowed to stay at Yale. You shouldn't kick them out, the student, uh, for what they were doing. So then Yale kicks David Graeber out. Don't know what happened to the student, actually. Anyway, uh, to my activist friends providing a, a even stranger problem, it's very difficult to know who I can actually refer to by name. That is, those whose legal names I actually know. I'm going to throw out just a few mainly because I happen to know they weren't mine. Okay, and a bunch uh, a list of other um, uh, people. Uh, so first was like uh, I think uh, people at Yale, then students at Yale, and now activists. Everyone in New York, Dan, and the ACA. Everyone in the IWW and the newly formed SDS. Uh, everyone looked over drafts and pieces of them to point out the endless things I got wrong. But really, anyone whose names appears in text deserves thanks much more. There are people who gave me a new sense of hope uh, for the planet. What would otherwise have been the worst time of my life? I have nothing but love for them. Obviously, there are a few in individuals I must especially sing out. And uh, Lauren Leaf, first and foremost, Eric, Eric Graber, Ruth Graber, Andrea Gabriel, uh, Non Lee, uh, Stuart Ro and Sue Rockfar. I like to thank Charlie Rose, my editor, and everyone else at AK Press that published the book. I came into this project with little but myself and my own sense of optimism. I pursued it with the growing understanding that no matter how bleak and how dangerous some of the places through which I must pass, to live as a rebel in the constant awareness of the possibilities of revolutionary transformation among those who deem, dreamed of it, it is surely the best way one can live. Now we're following to just the introduction. At this pace, I'm probably going to do like 200 like streams of this. Now just 25 streams, I know. Hope everyone's enjoying it, though. Introduction. I think once I finish the introduction, then I'll finish the stream. Because I am have gone live for our, an hour and a half. Actually, let's do this. Let's mm, take a break, actually. Um, and practice uh, self-care. So... Now let's just do like a couple minutes, break, 30 minutes break. So everyone who's still watching, if you're still watching, thank you. Um, but I'm go let's go and take a break to stretch our legs, get a snack or something like that. Um, get uh, use the bathroom or uh, get something to drink. So I do have the be right back, and then transition. And we'll be right back uh, shortly.
All right, I'm sitting back down and I'm gonna transition back over. And, and thank you, Naz and Echo, um, for following me. I didn't get the alert whatsoever. That happened an hour ago. That I've been streaming since then. So I don't know why I'm not getting alerts. It's been frustrating for me. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, let's go back to the uh, book, the introduction of direct action. Let's... And while I'm here, so also uh, Lin Wu, shout her out. She also has like done like the just chatting streams like this where like all uh, all like yesterday or Friday uh, she was just like going over like Google Maps or something and so check that out. Uh, but she also has done like a read-alongs of like uh, articles and uh, other political uh, stuff like that. And and sometimes she also like uh, plays um some games like I've seen her play uh, Stardew Valley. So yeah, check out Lin Wu. Let's see, let's also shout out Naz the Neko since they now follow me. Does that work? Yes, Naz the Neko was playing Among Us. Naz the Neko is a very sweet, um, a trans, uh, furry a lady. So give uh, Naz the Neko and Lin Wu a follow if you haven't already. But now let's go back to direct action and iconography. Introduction. Uh, you begin with rage, and you move to the silly fantasies. So, Jagger says, I have an idea for what Yacht's best might contribute to the actions of Quebec City. The Canadian press keeps framing this as some kind of alien invasion. Thousands of American anarchists are going to be invading Canada to disrupt the summit. The Quebecois press is go doing the same thing. It's the English invasion all over again. So my ideas were to play with that. We reenact the Battle of Quebec. Puzzle stare from the Americans at the table. That was the battle in 1759 in which the British conquered the city in the first place. They surprised the French garrison by climbing in up th these cliffs just to the west of the plains of Abraham, near the old fort. And so here's my idea. You guys can suit up in in your Yabusta outfits and climb the exact same clip. Except, no, wait, listen, this part is important. It, all over the padding of the chemical jumpsuits, you'll all be wearing Quebec, nurse, Quebec Nordic's uh, hockey jerseys. You want us to climb up the cliff? Asked Moose. Uh-huh. And how high is exactly this cliff? Oh, I don't know. 60 meters. What's that about? Uh, 180 feet? You want us to climb up a 180 feet cliff, geared up in gloves and helmets, gas masks, and form rubber padding? Moose, acting as if Jagger might actually be serious about this. Think of it as this way. The helmets and padding would be very helpful if you fell down at all, which is likely because you have to f uh, figure the cliffs would would be defended. Moses, oh great! So they were now climbing up a hundred eighty foot cliff with riot cops all over to the top. Oh come on! You're probably all going to get arrested immediately for just wearing those suits. You might as well actually do something with them, and some its symbolism would be perfect. I refuse to be so pessimistic, I say. Let's imagine some of us go uh, gets through. We scale the cliffs, and suddenly we're inside the security perimeter. Well actually no, says Jaga. Looking down at the map of this looking down at the map of the city, the map of the city is drawn in felt tip and on a large unfolded napkin. Uh, on the table of a pastry shop in New York City's Little Italy, surrounded by various salt shakers and sugar bowls and being used to represent imaginary activists and police units, all flanked by empty bottles of beer and a former chocolate cake. Six activists are crowded around the table. Uh, three Canadians, three representatives of the New York Yabastas Collective, all that are left of what started as a much larger 
uh, group. Hmm. We're kind of assuming the fence would actually be run around the edge of the clip as well. And Jacker confers briefly with his two Quebec friends who nod agreed in agreement. One, Nikolai, add another line to the map to make this more explicit. You mean we can get over the cliffs if we just uh, have to go over the wall? Someone asks. Oh, come on, says Jaga. Hey, if you can get up a 180 foot cliffs and, and a 15 foot uh, chain link fence, is, is going to be a problem? Fine, we're inside. I'm insisting on my scenario. 50 activists in yellow chemical jumpsuits, and what was it? Some Quebec team's uh, hockey jerseys mix it over the wall. We're all inside the secure perimeter, and we reverse the British. We have the we have reversed the British invasion. Now what do we do? Occupy the citadel? Present a petition? Actually, that would be really funny," says one of the Yabias. Is we fight all the way to the cliff and pass 2,000 uh, riot cops. We go over the wall, and then when we get there, we just present a petition. To who? Well, to Bush, obviously. How do we know uh, where Bush is going to be? Asked someone else. He will be standing in the Concord Hotel, says one of the uh, Quebecois uh, anarchists. It'll be easy to find. You can in, see it from almost anywhere in the city, especially, especially easy now. He smiles. Just look for the building with the surface to air missiles on top. Hmm. Plus about 10,000 snipers and secret service men, presumably, with endless high-tech surveillance equipment. Which will in turn be disrupted by our vast and fleet of rem remote control model airplanes. I need a burp. I, yeah, I felt the air coming up in my throat, and I felt like I was going to burp, but I, it didn't. <clears throat> ah. Anyway, that's going to annoy me a bit. Mm. Anyway, uh, conversation had in fact been seriously denigrated for at least a half an hour. Degenerate, degenerating, degrading, degenerating for at least half hour. It had started out serious enough as one of those three hour marathon conversations about everything. The Canadians were in town as part of a traveling activist tour and put together er, by the CLAC, a Montreal group based anarchist group whose French acronym stands for Convergence. I'm sorry, Latano. Uh, Convergence de les anti-capitalists, or Convergence of Anti-Capitalist Struggles. It was early March 2001. They were touring to mobilize against the Summit of America to, to be held in Quebec City on April 20th to be attempted by every head of state in Western Hemisphere, except, Can except Cuba. Yeah, except Cuba. <clears throat> oh, there we go! Finally! I finally burped. I, I I knew a burp was coming. My apologies. But I knew a burp was coming. I just... Finally. I felt like someone needed to come over and pat me on the back to just get that burp. Anyway. That's going to be a highlight. This event was to see the signing of the preliminary draft of something called the Free Trade Area of the America Act. Americans Act, an attempt essentially to extend NAFTA to the entire hemisphere. This effort, spearheaded by the United States, were in fact ultimately foiled, and the people in the pastry shop, unlikely th through it may seem, unlikely though it may seem, played a significant role in foiling them. But this is a bit different of a story, and anyone jumping ahead at, and, and anyway, I'm jumping ahead. At any rate, the conversation started out in the Lower East Side Mexican restaurant called Tez... Tez Azteca, um, where several activists from New York Central District, uh, New York City Direct Action Network took the visitors. The Jacob from Montreal and a quieter 
a Francophone couple from Quebec City itself out to din dinner. Actually, did two of the NAC Dan people were themselves Canadian, a couple named Mark and Lesser. Originally from Toronto, currently live in New York. She was a sociologist student at Columbia. He's currently employed as a house painter and volunteer for the National Lawyer Guild. Most of the others were also part of the NC, uh, NYC La Bista Collective. This was a newly created group inspired by a group of the same name in Italy, whose name, however, was derived from the slogan, It means enough already. Hmm. And made famous by the Zapatistas' rebellions in Chavez, who had, in turn, began their insurgency on July 1st, 1994, the day that NAFTA went first into effect. In anarchist circles that in anarchist circles that in activist circles that year, La Bista had something of the quality of the next big thing, probably. This was most of all for their spectacular and innovative tactics. Members of the group were famous for covering themselves in all sorts of elaborate padding made from everything from foam rubber sheeting to rubber ducking float rubber ducky floaty I knew another verb was coming. Uh, rubber ducky flotation devices. Combining it with helmets and plastic shields so one look like some kind of futuristic Greek tablet. Then topping the whole thing with gas masks and white chemical protection suits. The the idea is that so soon up there's relatively little uh, the cops can do with actually hurting you. Okay. Of course you are rendered so clumsy there's probably not much that you can do to hurt anyone else. But that's the kind of point. Ex exponents the claim that tactics is rooted in new philosophy of civil disobedience, where the old fashioned uh, masochistic, uh, Gandhian approach of encouraging activists to hold out their willingness to let the people beat them up as a sign of moral superiority. The white overalls propose the ethos of protection. As long as you refuse to harm others, it's completely legitimate to take whatever measures necessary to avoid harm to yourselves. The costume also made one look rather ridiculous, but that's kind of the point too. Labista's com Labista cl uh, columns would often play on it uh, by, for instance, attacking police lines with balloons and water pistols. What really impressed a lot of activists in America, though, was that some such groups had a real social social base. Labistas emerged from Ita Italy, extremely extensive network of squats and uh, uh, occupied social centers. Uh, white overalls began in effect as any army of squats. They also had their own intellect intellectuals. Around the time, the work of the Italian autonomous thinkers like Tigo Nagari, Paolo Ver Verne Verno, and, and Bifo Berini were just beginning to be translated and disseminated over the internet and were being picked up by activists across America. I shouldn't exaggerate, in the spring of 2001, the vast majority of American anarchists knew nothing of the Italian theory. Still, there were certainly very enthusiastic exceptions. In New York, the most significant among them was a man who went by the name Moose, a tall, gangly young man who almost always wore a fisherman's cap. Moose was, by profession, a retorture of fashion photos. He was also active in the... the um, Sometimes I can speak. Uh, DYC Dan, inspired by, uh, inspired by what he had read about the movement in Italy after Yapis's dramatic appearance at the IMF protest in Prague, Moose did a little research and figured out where you could actually buy cheap chemical chump suits. He mail ordered several of them and started organizing, occasionally wearing them to the march to marches. I feel another burp coming up. Anyway, one day during a 
police brutality march, a student from Italy who had actually done some work with Yapistas walked up to him and asked what was going on, and so, and so New York Yapista was born. It was, in his conception, simultaneously an embrace of Italian tactics and some of the border, pr broader principles developed by Italian autonomous Marxists, which emphasized the refusal of work exodus or engage withdrawal from the mainstream in institutions and, critically, freedom of movement across borders in Italy. White overall, in Italy, white overall, Freedom of movement across borders. In Italy, white overalls have made a series of dramatic uh, actions against immigration detention camps. Nice. To highlight the fact that much of what was touted as globalization actually meant, in practice, opening borders to the movement of money, manufacturers, and certain forms of information, while radically increasing the barriers and controls over the movement of human beings. This idea had already stuck in its struck a chord in New York in North American America, where activists were fond of pointing out that the US Border Patrol had actively tripled in size in years since the signing of NAFTA. A lot of us were already arguing that the whole point of free trade was in fact to confine most of the world's populations in impoverished global ghettos with heavily militarized borders in which existing social protections could be removed and the resulting terror of dispossession this this preparational fully exploited my brain cannot figure out how to pronounce that word. Fully exploited by de depression, uh, depreciation, depreciation, and the resulting terror and depreciation fully exploited by global capital. The question was how to bring the two ideas, the two ideas and tactics together. And again, I still feel the burp coming up, and it hasn't come up yet. Sorry for breathing and directly joining the most in the microphone. But it's important to breathe. If nothing else, the protests excited people. The NYC Yabistas collectively grew rapidly, and just as similar collectives, the Wobblies in England, the Wombats in Australia, were <coughs> growing all over the Anglophone world, much of the first part of the conversation at Teleseskas had consisted of most talking about Yapistas. Later, at the pastry shop, Jenkins' friends insisted we find one, as he was something of a chocolate addict. The discussion moved on to the potential border actions, the state of anarchy in Canada's Ontario's assholes governor, movements so moments of celebrities and why they're so annoying, philosophies, anthropologies, music, a typical endless activist conversation about everything. That is every episode of Social Justice Alchemy. We go through current events, politics, and we just run out of things to say and just thought I'd talk about music or whatever comes to mind, cats. So yeah, a typical... Endless activist conversation is what you get at Social Justice Alchemy every Saturday. At uh, 2 p.m. ETC e ESD and 6 p.m. UTC. Um, Jagger explains that as much as in Canada, Quebecois, Quebecois anarchists were divided largely between hardcore squadron types and grad students. There's that, my burp. Excuse me. Again, I felt it coming up, but it's just like, it, it, it hasn't come up yet. It's like, uh, not a highlight. Um, likely these two, um, likely, every time I drink, I will feel like a number coming. Like, uh, like these two, they probably quit the moon, uh, quit the moment the dissertation is, dissertation, uh, um, Talk about the grad students like these two, and they would probably quit them when the dissertation is finished. Though there was also a smattering of old-fashioned syndicalist types. 
No anarchist labor movement per se, but they work within existing unions. The real dramatic growth had been within the globalist movement, whereas in so many places there were emerging divisions of labor between NGOs and big labor groups, which dominated policies, discussions, and anarchists who quickly coming to dominate the direct action ends of things. In Montreal, there were basically two groups organizing actions, KLLC and something called Operation Sommelier. KLLC is, isn't officially anarchist, of course. Officially, it's just anti-authoritarian. Well, anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist, opposed to all forms of ra racial and gender oppression, they dedicate direct action, and unwilling to negotiate with inherently undemocratic organizations, which in practice means basically anarchists. I agree. So what about the so what about some aliens? They aren't anarchists. Oh, well, I'm sure there's some people in there who consider themselves anarchists of some sort or another. So what are they then? Mark interject. Oh, you know, the usual anti-corporate types, not anti-capitalists. They originally came out of the campaign against the multilateral agreement on investments in 1998. At the, at the time, they organized a really good action in Ottawa. But, well, they're pacifists. I guess that would be the best way to sum it up. Still filling that burp, come here. Do you see the guidelines they propose for the Quebec and city action? Asked Jaggard. Absolutely nonviolence. Absolute nonviolence. Part of their principles of conduct were no verbal violence. No one's allowed to use bad language. No, literally. I'm not making this up. Spray painting slogans in the fo is a form of violence. No wearing masks or any other items of clothing that cover your face. Uh, it's kind of a liberal group, if I would call it. The other Canadians were joining in, which then gives them the right to micromanage everything. Mm. Feeling that burp coming up, it'll come up eventually. They're totally control freaks, marshals, everywhere, everything. So I don't get it, says one of the Americans. What kind of process do these guys use? Yeah, another American asked. Are they democratic or do they have a formal leadership structure? Before reaction, do they hold sp spoke councils? Oh yeah, 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 they do all that. Or at least they do now. When they started out, it was totally top down with a charismatic leader, orders from above. Essentially, that's all changed now. But all the key decisions, like the code of conduct, are always made in the in the call to action before you even show up to spokes councils. So it's basically a sham because with marshals to control everything, any kind of self organization becomes meaningless. Plus, says Jager, uh, they still do some have a sort of charismatic leader, which, well, okay. Have you noticed how pacifists always seem to develop a charismatic leader? Gandhi, King, the Dalai Lama. Something about the pacifist ethos seems to just produce them. When I was in at age 16, we, that's like the August 16th one, of which year, I don't know, I think it was like, we can go, people can go back to the introduction, the uh, preface to see that. Uh, I saw those idiots carried signs of huge pictures of Gandhi on them, and below it was some kind of like quote from him saying, "What's important is not me, but the message." So I had, I had to go up to them and ask, "Don't you think there's a bit of contradiction here?" Discussion ensues on the merits of Gandhi, as opposed to the other figures in the Indian independence movement. Uh, the consensus seems to be that he's a highly abrasive, a highly abilent figure. On the other hand, he had led a lot of very, he had a lot of very anarchist ideas. On the other, he was a weird, sexually twisted patriarch who collaborated with the far, with the far from revolutionary Congress party and openly fosters the cult of personality around himself. 
Were the Canadians insist Gandhi's pacifism actually delayed independence by a generation? One of the Americans emphasized that Gandhi did also that while nonviolence was an idea, those who resist oppression violently are morally superior to those who do not resist at all. A sentiment and his more self righteous Westerners acolytes always seems to forget. Gandhi was a sex pest too. He would like sleep with like fifteen year old girls to try to like uh test his um sobriety. No, not sobriety. It's being sober. Cel celibacy. So yeah. I don't have a lot of love for Gandhi. Anyway, continuing. What's bothering me about the whole concept of pacifism, says Mark, is that it's fundamentally elitist. Poor people, people who have lived every day with violence by police, who are used to it, who expect it, they're not going to see any anything admirable, let alone heroic, in inviting police violence and then facing it passively. I so. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Paige. And hey, little groundhog. And how's it going? Shout out Groundhog because I caught a bit of your stream last night, of course. As, and happy birthday, Groundhog, as you had your birthday just recently. But Groundhog was playing uh, Morrowind. That's good. That's good. And I agree with you, Groundhog. Even though I love Oblivion and I love Skyrim, Morrowind is probably the best Zelda Scrolls game. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it sort of reminds me of another book that I listened to the audio version of from uh, Audible Anarchist by Peter Gendelos, How Non-Fines Protect the States. And I think some of these um, critiques of the pacifism here is echoed in that book and the much larger text. So anyway, I always found such such options slightly disconcerting coming from who they are. Mark is one of the most likable, easygoing, rather self-effacing, silly people I know. I often wonder if he's even capable of anger. His wife is m much the same. What do you think? I asked Lexley. Oh, I totally agree. First of all, the whole idea that you're going to reveal the, tr the true corrosive coercive nature of the state by showing how they will attack you even you even when you are posing in them no physical threats well come on you're telling poor people something they don't already know i work with ocab uh that's the um ontario collection and again collection coalition against poverty i can't speak sometimes for three years in Toronto, says Mac. And one thing we found it, it, is that if, say, you're working with homeless people or genuinely oppressed communities, either they're not going to do anything or they're going to want to directly confront the people who's been fucking them over. Which is how you get those riots, like the ones in last spring in Toronto. Leslie explains Mark is referring to a uh, march on June 15, 2000, organized by OCAP, in which over a thousand homeless people, along with housing activists, were attacked by riot police when they, when they insisted on the right to address uh, Parliament and ended up in a pitch battle that lasted hours. Again, they started out as protests, the police turned them into riots. It seems like riot police only knows how to riot. Anyway, um, after the third... Brain fog on like, how to pronounce this one. Clear, the Calvary charge against peaceful protesters... Hmm. Yeah, they are. If you give those police those tools and weapons, they were just itching to use them. Finally, we get to use this tank. Finally, we get to use all this tear gas we're collecting. Yeah, every tool's a hammer doctrine. Yeah, I agree. Everyone just explodes. They start throwing everything inside, ripping up the sidewalks, the street signs, throwing trash cans. Now, wait a minute, I protest. 
Gandhi himself worked with a lot of poor people. True, Jagger interjects, but that's within a very specific religious tradition. If you were a Hindu, being able to endure your lonely position within the caste hierarchy, making, making that a sign of virtue, that's what it's all about. <sighs> the caste system in India. I bet there's a lot of Indian uh, anarchists and leftists who love to like destroy the caste hierarchy. I should research that as well. But it's a hierarchy, so it really has to be un not coercive at all, be voluntary, and has to justify its own existence. I doubt the caste system does that, though. And so on. The whole com the whole conversation seems to me a little pat, pat on one side. I pointed out that... Oh, finally, there's my burp. Mm. I pointed out that since, Se since Seattle... <clears throat> Excuse me. Unions have been panicking about the possibility of violence or even just property damage. Uh, others encountered that I was like talking about union bureaucrats, not the rank and file. Yeah, I bet that's the kind of union that my dad's a part of because he's uh, he works at Boeing, and I think it's that kind of like a liberal union. Well, what about the poor people's group that critique military tactics as a product of middle-class white privilege? That real oppressed groups would never be allowed to get away with. Someone changed the subject. And have you noticed how this what, Sal Amia? I probably finally figured out how to pronounce that word. The name of the group. Types are always keeping track of which politicians or celebrities or rich people approve of them? The whole mindset is completely elitist. Yeah, the, the, it was mentioned in the previous chapter and previous pages, and I like how yeah, that's, it seems like one of those slow social democratic or reformist Marxist groups, as opposed to like the CA, CLAC, which is more of an anarchist group. Anyway, Sal Salamia put out their pacifist call to action, and then CLAC put out their own, calling for a diversity of tactics. And by this, they meant space should be made for art and puppets. Space should be made for traditional Gandhian come-take-me-away civil disobedience, and space should be made for more militant tactics, too. The critical thing is to ensure that, in the end, everyone will stand in solidarity with one another. As it turns out, a very few people registered for the Sal Amiya Spokes Council, so they canceled it, and now we're concentrating on doing something in Montreal. CLAC's Spokes Council, on the other hand, went well enough that it led to the creation of a new local group called the CASS, CASA. The Summit of the Americans Welcoming Committee, uh, CASA, was now doing frantic local organizing. Teams were going door to door in working class neighborhoods near the old fortresses. It was a unique opportunity because the Canadian police had recently announced that come the summit, the old town and the area surrounding the convention center were where the meeting were to be held was going to be surrounded by a four kilometer long security fence. The wall, as was mentioned in the preface. Only those with ID cards and surf ID card certifications that they live within the perimeter would be allowed inside. They kept issuing constitutionary statements as to where and exactly the fence would run but it would definitely be cutting many neighborhoods in half. Children would have to pass heavily have to pass heavily militarized police checkpoints to return home from school. Local people were already referring to it as the wall. One should bear in mind, Jagger noted that this is a population that's because it is uh, of its history already extremely suspicious of central government. Even Quebecois uh, nationalism is very weird. Pluritarian 
I know how to pronounce that word on the leftists. Proletarian kind of nationalism. French speakers see themselves as the white working class of Eastern Canada, which to some extent is true. It was at this point, right around the time Mac and Lesler had to leave, that we got into the politics of the wall, about to promise militaris militarization of the Canadian border during trade talks in Winster, or in the year before, for instance. Two-thirds of the Americans who tried to cross the border were turned away, and a fair number of them were arrested. The question was how to plan a broader action that would draw attention to the hypocrisy of, hypocrisy of militarized, militarizing the borders and building a wall inside a city in order to be able to shield the political leaders from any danger of, contract with their, of contact with their constituents. Not to mention the rhetoric of free trade, knocking down walls and unifying the planet, when in order to even be able to sign them, one has to do the exact opposite. The rest of us started bouncing around ideas, possible border actions. Eventually this started leading to the scenario questions and then to the cliffs of Quebec City. That was towards the end of the conversation actually. By that point, we were all a bit worse for wear, and not long after we broke, we went home and went to sleep. About this book. Uh, so, again, this is like uh, the last six pages of the introduction to Direct Action and Econography by David Braybird. It, which, uh, Groundhog, if you don't know, you probably already know that it, this book is available on the Anarchist Library. That's how I got this uh, uh, ebook. How about this book? It started with the conversation at the pastry shop for a number of reasons. For one, it's funny. I thought it might be it convey something of a sense of a movement that is, as we shall see, particularly prone to forms of actions that are simultaneously profoundly foolish and and utterly serious. The white overalls from the Yapistus. Such a conversation, especially juxtaposed with the serious arguments about Gandhi and so forth, it, which actually does go to show that, like, the stereotype about leftists arguing uh, amongst each other whenever they're in a room or in the online community of some sort. Yeah, it's true. Leftists are often arguing against each other. Hopefully, most of the times it's, like, um, respectful. It's not always. Depends on what the subject's about and so forth, seems the best way to give the reader an immediate sense about what's being involved with such a movement is actually like. Also, it makes it for a better book. Such a conversation also, always, also immediately raises an issue I'll be struggling with throughout the book. What does one do with actor's identity when discussing political and legal sensitive conversations? New York Yambistas, for example, is almost certainly still listed in certain police in intelligence systems as a terrorist organization. In the weeks before the summit, both America and Canadian pol police identify it as one of the pl uh, principal uh, potential violent elements. Anyone suspected in of anyone suspected of involvement in Yabistas was seized when trying to cross the border and detained for days. <clears throat> Finally, there's my burp. And extensively interrogated. All this was ridiculous. Yabista, as I mentioned, was based on principles of what sometimes is called radical defense. Members armed themselves uh, against the batons and rubber bullets, but they're justified doing so precisely because they refuse to do anything that might harm anyone else. But in this context, the fact that claims are ridiculous is largely irrelevant. Reclaimed Streets New York, a group that specializes in unpermitted un street parties had been classified by a certain police task force as a terrorist organization as well. Let's see, let's click. Can we click on here? Yes, it will go to the notes uh, 
at the same time, I, I did that because while in some books, it's just like, this is the source for this. Other times, no, they're like David Graeber has done this in his other books. He actually like writes something in the footnotes. So that's why I like looked on it to see. At the same time, others equally put... Uh, at the same time, other equally political, equally pu public groups that are, in fact, engaged in more militant activists and never seem to appear on the same list. The apparitions made this all a uh, very effective strategy, so no one feels safe. However, there's no real way to know whether one is dealing with an intentional strategy or simply the, uh, the effects of bureaucratic stupidity. Go back to the introductions. Uh, these things never make any sense. One thing one learns quickly as an activist is that the hand of repression is extremely random. As a result, the conversations with which I began, however, obviously frivolous, could coincidentally be classified as terrorist conspiracy. Coincidentally. Uh, imagine, for a moment, that this has been a hidden microphone in the pastry shop. Imagine some policeman or FBI agent monitoring the above conversation. This is not a this is not outside the realm of possibility. Perhaps they had been expecting some mas uh, mafia to meet there and plan an actual crime. Mafiosa. My brain finally figured out what that word uh, how to pronounce the word. Because um, I heard of Masvidosa before, but I didn't see the word actually itself, so I couldn't connect to it until just then. Uh, next, imagine a unlikely possibility that the policeman listening to this conversation has absolutely no sense of humor. What would he likely need to think? Here are the members of a possible terrorist organization. They are meeting with a Canadian named Jagan Singh and talking and and talking about taking part in some kind of violent conflict involving President Bush. If the officer in question proceeds to run the names past the Canadian police, he would immediately be informed that Jagan Singh is a notorious anarchist who's been arrested time and time again in connections with illegal protests. Now, this latter point is technically true, but once again, absurd as in uh, absurd if you have the slightest bit of context in Canada, Jagged is of something of a public figure. He's appeared on TV regularly as spokesperson for CLAC or some other radical organization. As a result, he gets arrested all the time. It becomes something of a running gag in radical circles in Canada. Before every big action or mobilization, the police will almost invariably come in and arrest Jagat Singh. Part partly, it would seem, just because he's only he's the only prominent anarchist they actually heard of. Here comes the anti-US protesters again, everyone in place. Uh, why gas checked? Shield and protons checked. As cure barriers checked. Jacket seeing arrested check. Oh, it's all sources. Of it. oh, okay, it's it's from that article. Okay. One could multiply examples. It's always a preventative arrest. Jagged has never actually been ch charged with much of anything, let alone convicted, at least in part because he never actually has done anything illegal. It's kind of like a lot of the kind of like a lot of the arrests that happens at BLM protests that's happened in the past year. Solidarity, no justice, no peace, no racist police. Black Lives Matter. More than anything else, Jagged is a radical journalist. As such, he becomes the regular public spokesperson for, re for revolutionary groups. But the whole point of using the same person as one spokesperson all the time is that that way, the faces of those actually planning the action n needs never be seen. The idea that Jagged, who is in fact on a public speaking tour, appearing under his own name, would come to an action planning meeting is absurd. But again... The fact that it is absurd is not strictly relevant. 
if the police decide to charge us all with conspiracy to commit an act of terrorism, legally, it would be it would quite possibly be possible for them to do so. They would have the extremely hard time can get a conviction, but they could easily make all of our lives quite difficult for years to come. Want to take a drink? All this makes the very idea of writing an epigraphy like this a highly dubious proposition. Well, one has to weigh the legal possibilities with the fact that nothing like that has ever actually happened. I don't believe that there has ever been a case over the last four years of an activist being arrested because of something they said or were said to have said in a meeting, let alone an informal conversation. Activists are regularly arrested for being public spokesperson, like Jagged. Activists have been detained at borders for belonging to supposedly violent organizations like, for instance, many of the members of the New York Yambistas collectives, uh, collectives were eventually to be. Hundreds of arrests and often ordinary citizens who just happened to be standing next to them again, like what's been happening in recent BLM protests, have been swept up in mass arrests during protests. Nothing has changed, honestly. Oh, which actually makes me, my choice of reading this book uh, quite uh, poignant. I also wanted to read it because, again, people think voting is direct action. I'm like, I, no, that can't be right. Anyway, when this... When this happens, a few will almost always be randomly singled out for felony charges, assaulting an officer or the like. These charges, um, these charges, almost never hold up because they are almost inev invariably completely made up. However, there's my burp. They succeeded in trying, in try, in tying activists down with endless court dates and legal fees. They have definitely been bizarre and outrageous acts of repression against individuals. Activists have been in jail for links, for links they put on web pages, or for the possession of devices used to detect genetic modified foods. None has been charged over anything they were supposed to have said in a meeting. Nevertheless. The fear that they might have had, the fear might have a stifling effect on the activists' lives for years, and that fear has only grown with increasing state repression. Oh man, that's just and all the times things that happen to like um, activists and protesters at Ferguson riots after uh, their photographs appear in on. Uh, social media and stuff like that but those were just not the state actually working but uh, far right uh, extremist groups and members anyway meetings themselves have become increasingly secretive those attending them become more paranoid the result i think has been disastrous um yeah actually i've heard from like others that in certain parts of america uh the idea you can't like just like sign up for the idea of, to be initiated into the IWW in certain chapters in rural parts of America, it's called almost kind of like thieves guilds levels where you have to like meet somewhere just in person and that person has to be like a um, screen to make sure that they're not a cop or anything like that. Um, and leftist or activists have always had to deal with like cops infiltrating their organizations. Uh, there's that one time in like the UK where uh, one undercover police officer uh, had a relationship with a leftist activist in the group as part of a spy operation. That cop fathered two kids with that activist for six years and was like, oh, I'm a cop. And they even say that, like, I'm a cop, but just left. He fathered two kids with that activist for six years and left. Those kids not knowing who their father was. Yeah, that happened. Uh, so yeah, that, that does explain the paranoia. 
They are particularly dangerous, in my opinion, because what goes on in meetings, the structure of decision making, is critical to the movement. Perhaps more than anything else, this is the movement for about creating new forms of democracy. I mean, that's why the chance of being on protests in the recent uh, months has been like, this is what the democracy looks like. Democracy is the people having power and people deciding and people making decisions, not representatives. That's where representative democracy is only democracy for representatives, I say. Uh, one reason why the media has been able to largely write off the so-called anti-globalization movement as a in incoherent babble of positions okay hi tally and yep still the same but still sleep that's good just just listen to my voice as i read out direct action and iconography where was i as incoherent babbles and positions without any central theme or central ideology is precisely because its ideology is embedded in its per in practice. In consequence, in contradictions to past revolution groups, we are not going to come up with some abstract party in line facing democracy and then turn ourselves into a well-oiled authoritarian machine dedicated to seizing power whenever possible. Mm -hmm so as to someday eventually be able to introduce its it groups like dan or the calc are determined to live to their to live their principles yes it is <laughs> this is by david graybird actually so yeah exactly uh how oh, it's an icc page and tavi cuddling home huh? it's like uh shadow the tavi because Tavi the Wolf has uh, raided my stream last night. And, 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 and Tavi, since you missed the first part of it, in case you missed the first part of it, part of why me reading this book out loud is because I haven't read it, be uh, David Graeber's tragic passing like oh, over a week ago. Oh, and I like David Graeber's writing. C, um, last Friday... Uh, just the past Friday, actually, um, people talk about voting, and I agree. Vote the vote if you can. The vote if, if for who you want to. I won't shame anyone for uh, voting, whoever, except for Republicans and GOP. If you're voting for the Republicans and GOP, you're probably just a fascist. <laughs> uh, oh, that's uh, nice. Uh, thank you, oh, Paige. Uh, yeah, I like it. But uh, last Friday, someone said, a liberal said to me, voting is direct action. I was like, because like people were talking about voting, and I say, yeah, vote, but do more than voting, do direct action. Someone said to me in response, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, 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 yeah, I no, no, it's not. No, that's why I, I want to read this book. Is because it's like, no, voting is not direct action. I heard this kind of take from a liberal before. This was from a friend. Steve Schatz is a friend, but he said, Yeah, you take, yes, you vote for someone to take action on your behalf. But this kind of mindset of what direct action is, is it's different from what we think is direct action. What Liberals think direct action because, again, Steve Shine said before, direct action, writing and emailing your rep representatives is direct action, according to Steve Shine's. And I was just like, what? And just like with like voting, uh, you're asking representatives to take the action for you. As opposed to, as David Graeber described, actually, in that uh, 2006 uh, interview with... Um, that he did on Charlie Rose that Anarchopact has on her channel. So go to Anarchopact's channel, which is a great channel in general on YouTube, and watch that interview. David Graeber talks about praxis, whereas, like, instead of waiting for the government to do something, like a city or a town that doesn't have clean drinking water, you take direct action doing praxis and dig the well yourself. Yeah. I agree. It's indirect action. And, uh, but that, uh, but I also noticed that the Anarchist Library has this, uh, David Graves' book of direct action in the library, so that's where I downloaded this book. 
and there's the link directly to that and that's why I'm reading them yeah I don't it's heavy so this is why I'm now going to add direct action to the list of political words that Americans are not allowed to use until they can prove they actually know what it means uh, so direct action will be added to the list of capitalism, socialism, communism, liberal. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's, I, I, it's, uh, I have friends that are liberals and I still care about them and I love them, but yet... Wait, so the only person here to be able to use direct action is me? <laughs> Brad. <laughs> I love Paige. So, uh, yeah, so uh, there are so many words that Americans are not allowed to use until they can prove they actually know what they mean. Direct action is not one of them. I mean, libertarians, Americans are not allowed to use libertarian until they can actually confirm what they mean. Um... Uh, liberal, conservative, fascist, capitalist, capitalism, um, socialism, communism, and all that sort of things. Because uh, radical is another one. Joe Biden, the radical leftist. Really, if Joe Biden is actually a radical leftist, I'll be happy to vote for him. He's not. And still don't know who I'm going to vote for. But I live in Washington State, a very blue state, as I said before earlier in the stream. So anyway, Tavis, so that's why I'm like I'm reading direct action and iconography. Plus, I actually quite like David Graeber's uh, writings and I uh, listen to the lectures. And I'm really actually fascinating. Um, what is it? So let's see. Um, i got to go back a little bit. Anti-globalization movement as an incoherent babble of positions without any central themes or central ideology is precisely because its ideology is embedded in its practice. In consensus contradictionary to past contradiction contra in contradiction contradiction ah, uh, to past revolutionary groups, we're going to come up with some abstract party line favoring democracy and then turn ourselves into a will or authoritarian machine de dedicated to seizing power whenever possible so as to someone eventually being able to introduce it groups like dan and or clac are determined to live these principles to a large extent, as I argued before in Graeber 2002. I think that will be like towards an anthropological... Anthropological... Anthrop <clears throat> it's late in the stream and I'm... <laughs> uh, okay. I think I was just talking about people who can't be bothered to learn the real distinction definitions of basic vocabulary words. Oh, fuck. I just realized we can tie this... In it's problem to the poor language education in U.S. schools. Yeah, calls for hot dog and hard cider. Will I? Will listen while I fetch these items. <laughs> I haven't drank. I'm not drinking alcohol because I am reading this, and it's just like no. I'm. I'm already struggling with some pronunciation of words. Yeah, hot dogs and ciders. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not going to drink until after I finish the stream, which uh, I'm going to finish the stream and my stream. It's good for two hours and 30 minutes. That's a good like, length. I'm going to finish the stream once I finish this introduction at this part. Got four pages left. Uh, and yet I want to, like, talk to these liberals and, like, try to, like, get ideas, plant seeds in their heads about, like, this, about do more than voting, about, like, local organizing, like, the, the union at the workplace and all this stuff. So, yeah, and there's also, like, all my things to follow. So check those out. Okay. Um, 
So I think a great two thousand and two is the towards the anthropological uh, theory of value, which I'm also reading on my own, and it's quite fascinating. The democratic practice they develop is their ideology. To my mind, this is an extremely healthy and extremely refreshing attitude. It's a large part of the reason I became involved in such groups to begin with. On the other hand, it is, creates some dilemmas of representation. <clears throat> there we go. Well, maybe that burp was coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a moment that sees itself movement that sees itself as creating new forms of democracy but because of security fears it's actually dem it's actual democratic practice process cannot be represented to anyone outside the movement in anything but the most abstract terms everyone is so worried about the dangers of legal repercussions that one could never talk about the country concrete specifics of what happened at any particular meeting it is especially ironic because this is a movement, movement that otherwise remarkably sophisticated at its self-representation. It includes a host of radical f filmmakers, web journalists, radio activists. It involves a vast independence media network that first emerges from Seattle and it has continued during every major convergence. Convergence. I probably was mispronouncing it throughout uh, the uh, preface and, inter and um, introduction. But anyway, to provide detailed minute by minute next page uh, accounts of the actions. Afterwards, a video documentary will quickly and inevitably appear. However, none of this representation would normally contain a single description of a concrete act of collective decision making. Every major action, for instance, tends to be preceded by a series of spokes councils, assemblies where hundreds or even thousands of people gather to plan the action collectively without any former leadership structures. Yes, it is possible. Yet none has ever been filmed. Um, this, despite the fact that at some point during at least the half the uh, at least half major councils I had spokes councils I have attended, some radical filmmaker asked permission to film some parts of the proceedings. They were invariably rebuffed. In principle, spokes councils are open events. Anyone is allowed in who is not working either for some news outlets or law enforcement, and participants are often reminded not to discuss anything they wouldn't want the cops to know. Still, when the requests are made to film, someone always blocks. As a result, as far as I'm aware, no such events has ever been recorded. So one ends up with video documentaries that shows activists marching down the streets chanting, This is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. But contains no image of anyone actually participating in democ practicing democracy. The result is a particular disconnect. When activists talk to each other, they tend to, they tend to talk endlessly about process. Hmm, it's good to be back, with cider. Uh, the nuts and bolts of direct democracy, while pre preparing for a major action, it seems all one does to go to meetings, trainings, more meetings, and more meetings. But when one reads accounts of the same action written afterwards, almost all of this tends to disappear. So, first of all, this book is meant to fill a gap. I will begin by using my own experience to convey a sense of what it is actually like to take part in the planning for and eventually participate in a major action against a global summit to illustrate the sort of things activists actually argue about what sort of issues or events become collective dramas to get some sense of what it's like to like wait through a marathon or two day meeting and to come out of it feeling as if one has in fact just wait through a marathon at some point uh, okay i kind of accidentally reread the same part but at the same time that one has witnessed something profoundly transformative as the reader may have noticed, I'm making no pretense of objectivity here. 
I, I do not become involved in this movement in order to write an iconography. I became involved as a participant. I came from a old leftist family of most and most of and for most of my life had considered myself an anarchist. If for most of my life I rarely got involved in the anarchist in politics, it was mainly because in the 1980s and much of the 1990s the anarchist politics I was exposed to stuck struck me as pretty atomized and pointless contentions full of would-be sectarian whose sex consisted only of themselves. To suddenly discover the existence of a movement with radical different sensibilities which place enormous emphasis on mutual respect, corroboration, and egalitarian decision-making was profound, profoundly exhilarating. It was as if uh, the moment I always wanted to be a part of has suddenly come to existence. Even when I'm critical of the movement, I'm critical as an insider, someone whose ultimate purpose is to further its goals. My eventual decisions to write iconography emerge from the same impulse. Can I take a drink? To some degree, of course, as a trained iconography, you can't really help yourself. Almost as soon as I got involved, I found that the notes I was taking at meetings were growing more and more detailed. They started containing little observations about hair, shoes, shoe styles, posture, habits, parental reflections on the little activist uh, rituals. Still, my decision to write all this in the iconography form came largely because, as a participant, it struck me as an important way of furthering one's of the movement's goals, the, the dissemination of a certain, a certain vision of democratic possibilities. In my anthropological training, I had acquired a skill that seemed perfectly suited for conveying much of what was missing from existing accounts of the movement. Though it did also occur to me that doing so would also make an extremely interesting iconography. But then there was the problem of how to do so without in actually endangering anyone. In the end, the solution I came up with was this. I feel like a burp coming again. It's going to come in there in mid sentence. I know it. The air's there. Anyway. This has been a problem throughout the last half of this like stream. On really sensitive information, as opposed to silly fantasies, I would not quote anything that had not already been said in some kind of public forum. I would quote things that had appeared on an activist um, list server, where which everyone knows are monitored. So in spokes councils or meetings open to public, that one has to assume are properly infiltrated. There's a note here. Some actions, spokes councils are very de decidedly not open, and I have avoided even mentioning them. There were none that I've known in Quebec. Groups like Direct Action Network in New York had open meetings, though more often than not, everyone at a given meeting know, knew each other. Groups like Lambistas were not exactly a close, but more intimate. I have therefore tried to avoid describing either the smaller Dan meetings or the uh, any Yabista meetings in any case in which action scenarios were discussed. <clears throat> finally, there's the burp. You see how long it takes for me to finally burp? Yeah, yeah, the burp was coming after I drink. Uh, let's see. Footnote 3, there it is. About other forms, I would be more opaque. Oblique? Anyway. Uh, when dealing with things said in public forms that had any bearings on actions, I would avoid using actual names. This is not hard because, for the most part, I don't actually know people's actual names. Or at least, I tend not to know full names. Many activists go by action names. Action names. Max power. My that's my action name, which they use even when uh, with their closest friends. In actress circles, it is possible to work very closely with someone for years. 
become close friends, even perhaps lovers, and never actually learn their full legal name. How many of us can, like, they know that experience of uh, being online? And actually, with, like, interacting with, like, radical leftists or fem radical feminists, sometimes, yeah, they want to protect themselves. So they never give you their real, actual legal name. It's always just, like, an online name. Again, I feel a burp coming, but I didn't want to come up. Huh. When do I know someone's name's? When when I do know someone's full legal name, it's almost inevitable, in, invariably because they are like jagged public figures of some sort or another whose identity does not need to be protected. Finally, whenever I am describing meetings or actions. I would stick to events in which I myself fully participated. This is meant this meant I would not be asking anyone to assume Brain Fog on how to pronounce this word pseudonymously a risk that I'm not willing to take undergo under my actual identity. I didn't have to start telling people the story of mobilization around the summit of the Americas in Quebec City, of course. There were a number of others I couldn't have chosen. In part, I started with Quebec precisely because of this sort of like consideration. Not only because of all the felons described in the accounts were committed in Canada, but also because this was a very militant event. The most militant, in fact in which I ever been involved, in which, as it happens, the most serious act, act of conspiracy of which I could not possibly be, I, of which I could possibly be accused, is conspiracy to pull down a chain link fence and then walk away from it. The story of Quebec City has other obvious advantages. For one, I think it's a pretty good story. It's also useful because I wanted to avoid both the temptation to idolize the movement or event or the the eventual annoying habit of many activists have of only thinking about its problems, which often leaves outsiders wondering why anyone would get involved in such a movement to begin with. The Quebec story seems perfect in this respect because it combines some of the best and the worst of everything. It allowed me to talk both about the groups whose dem democratic process worked remarkably well and others in which it was quite, really quite atrocious. Both groups were in which endured and both groups that fell apart, both actions that were immensely successful and others that were complete disasters. Structure of the book. Part one, therefore, is largely about be about Quebec. Uh, chapter one will consist of a kind of diary of account of the month immediately following the CAAC, CLAC's caravan's visit. Chapter two of a more detailed account of the consul consulates in Quebec City about a month before the action. Chapter three will describe events leading up to the <sighs> finally there's that burp. It's like a minute or two. Uh, leading up to the ab abortive action at the Seaway International Bridge at Aquisin. Chapter 4 will describe the Quebec action themselves. It will take the form of a first person narrative with a fair amount of reconstructed dialogue of the kind. Tempest Wolf has dog uh, Siderson dog now. Good. I'm, I'm I'm coming to the end of the stream and the end of the uh, uh, introduction, kind of which I is um with a fair amount of reconstructed dialogue, of the kind which I began. And so, if anyone has some like um ideas of who I can like raid out to, please suggest it in the chat. It will also include some pretty extensive, um, extras from the field notes. This mainly consists of detailing reconstruction of what each person actually said at important activist meetings. I know Camasots. Maybe they'll be cool to write into Camasots. Yeah. Hello, Franzo. Friso. Uh, which each person. 
Uh, anyway, um, they mainly consist of detailed reconstructions of each person's actually said at important activist meetings, but with occasional comments and reflections. Part 2 would consist of analysis. It begins, Chapter 7, with comments on the social content. Hmm. Okay, I'm probably considering a modern gene. And so, uh, about which I believe there's a great deal of misunderstanding. This will be followed by a long chapter, chapter 8, on meetings and experiments and creations of new democratic forms. Another mapping out the totality of actions. Chapter 9, and then finally, discussion on of the politics of representation, media, puppets, and so on, chapter 10. I will end with a theoretical conclusion. Imagination, chapter 10, consisting of a single chapter about violence and the imagination. Writing this book, uh, particularly the first part, has presented me with some real dilemmas of representation. I first tried to write part one almost completely in diary form, which I thought would give some sense of rapture and quality of activist life. Uh, it was impossible, though, to maintain this for one thing. Uh, it is soon become apparent that if I did any real justice to the richness of events, I would produce a book that no press would even consider publishing. It would be far too long. Contestation, however, brought with its endless compromise. The more one had to economize economize the more the, the urge to put the whole thing in some sort of overall narrative 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 imperative imperatives on the other hand to some degree flew directly in the face of the logic of what I was trying to describe most obviously good narratives don't have uh, hundreds of characters yet to employ standard narrative techniques and allow some individuals to type, typify others would not em, to employ exactly the logic of representation that the activist decision-making structures I was trying to can describe were trying to hardest to avoid. Even more, to place too much of a narrative framework on events would necessarily or was it, that's necessary obscure the actual experience of direct action in which one spends months preparing events that one hopes could be narrative narrated in certain ways pass through a brief brief flurry <sighs> flurry remember how to pronounce it correctly well i knew how to pronounce it correctly just like my mouth did not work with my brain well at that time a brief a brief flurry of actions in which one has very little idea of what is going on, and then ultimately spend weeks trying to figure out what happened and arguing about how the story should, in fact, be told. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the introduction with the conversation at the uh, pastry shop, yeah, leftists tend to have uh, arguments about like things. I hope I have come, uh, uh, yeah, a group of leftists are just always going to argue about something. Yep, practice safe self-care. I hope I come up with a reasonable compromise, a story that is at the same time readable, publishable, and at least somewhat true to the integrity of its objects. I also hope the results will live up to the best tradition of iconography, an attempt to describe and to capture something of the texture and richness of an underlying sense of, of a way of being and doing that not otherwise been be captured in writing. I also hope that, in doing so, I could offer the reader a glimpse of one small North American fraction of a much larger, growing global social movement whose existence many are not even really aware of. Alright, and that was just the introduction, and I finished there with the prefix, preface to direct action and iconography. So, next time, I'm, when I'm going to be like doing this, I'll sort from chapter one. A good place to stop. 
uh, which has 39 pages. Probably, maybe I can be able to uh, do a chapter per stream, depending on the number of pages. But as you can see there, there's my uh, follow link. So just you can follow me on Twitter, on YouTube, and on Tumblr. Uh, there's the links there. There's the links to Social Justice Alchemy, which is a podcast I co-host every, and live stream on YouTube every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and 6 p.m. UTC. Uh, we just, me and a bunch of other libertarian socialists just sit around. Uh, we talk about some current times current events. We talk about politics. We talk about anarchism feminism, and socialism, uh, communism, all that stuff, or whatever just comes to our minds. We're very unprofessional. We really should, uh, some of us should really prepare for that. But also, uh, quite a few of us either have day jobs, all of us have day jobs, or most of us have day jobs, or we're spoonies. And so, I mean, uh, we just, it's tiring just to like live for the most part. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Please do check it out. Happens every Saturday. And also that link there is a, it's a Google Doc of charity links that I put together. Some which is for my friends. And I really want, um, I hope at least share around the Google Docs and say, hey, there's a bunch of charities that you can consider donating to. If you have the money, if you have money lying around. Um, the donation bar is specifically for my friend Joanna, who I'm doing this like charity stream for. And that's her story right there. You're welcome, Paige. No problem. I, I'm glad to uh, uh, finally do this kind of like stream. I've been wanting to like do this kind of stream, and I hope that it's been like entertaining, and engaging for everyone. Uh, there's uh, my friend Joanna's um, information. There's the link to her baking bowl and her Tumblr post. She is a woman that has like three different um, conditions that make her a disability. You're welcome, Tavi. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you, Lin Wu. Thank you, Daniel D. Quack. Thank you, Paige the Groundhog. Thank you, Frizo. Thank you, everyone who come and join us um but check out uh, at least share around joanna's um uh bacon bowl in that tumblr in that post there uh check her out on tumblr if you want she's a cool um nerdy uh check as well uh but uh and, uh, donate to paypal directly if you can it won't affect the donation bar i'll find out how much she received and maybe update that donation bar if she did receive donations thank you so much if you have thank you so much for coming and staying around and thank you to like checking those things out and sharing around if you do and now uh we are going to raid and thank you nas and echo for following me mona g there we go found her so we're going to start raiding mona g who is just chatting uh it's a, a streamer that i'm not following so Tabby, uh, it's come to recommend by Tabby, and I trust Tabby's uh, recommendation should be good. So as you re-raid out, just say raid, or maybe Kiki raid, and something like that. So let's start the raid. Thank you all for coming. Don't forget to practice self-care, and uh, uh, I don't know when I'm going to like uh, doing this. Check out my Twitter, uh, some random geek with threes instead of ease and geek for, um, when, um, I will do another stream because I don't have a schedule. Um, it's whenever I feel like it, honestly, but I'm glad to do the stream. So everyone go right on moment of G and thank you for coming. Uh, be social. All right. I think that worked. So now 